One of the tenets of a good governance, of a good business, is, and I quote, we like businesses that throw off a lot of cash and do not have high maintenance capital expenditures. The, on page three of your fiscal year ending June 13th, you define, it is defined, I don't know that you defined it, but somebody defined it, probably <coughs> the financial director. Town council is responsible for passing ordinances, adopting the annual budget, appointing committees, and hiring both the town manager and the town assessor. The town manager is responsible for carrying out the policies and ordinances of the town council, for overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of government, and for appointing the administra administrators of the various departments. From day one with this budget fight, the council has told us they don't want any increases. No increases, we want a flat budget. And yet, what do we hear from our town manager? We hear that we have to increase and proposes a budget of 13 jobs. And we know, and then last week he stands up here and says, I know I'm not going to get them all. Well, you know what? You shouldn't get any of them. We don't have any money for 13 jobs and 800 to $900,000. I got one. I'm, I'm going to make this. I'll shorten my, what I was going to say. There's just no time to say any of this. In this paper, when they say about cuts in jobs, these are cuts in proposed jobs. They're not real jobs. I had asked last week for a listing of where people would cut from the budget and where people would, and where, how you would increase revenues without taxation. Nobody did anything. Calvin Coolidge. President of the United States, 1920s, 30th President of the United States. Nothing is easier than the expenditure of public money. It doesn't appear to belong to anyone. The temptation is overwhelming to bestow it on somebody. You're doing a good job. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Dick Springer. I live uh, at apartment J313, 15 Piper Road. That's Piper Shores. Yes. Uh, I think people should be aware of the, well, of the fact that the town council really is between a rock and a hard place, and they have been put there by the state government, and especially Governor Paul LePage, who has drastically reduced uh, revenue sharing to the towns and uh, in addition, have, by cutting the circuit breaker program, has forced the town council to raise taxes to do what it would have been able to do if the, if the, gov if the state government has done, had done what it traditionally has done. I think we should not put blame on the town councilors here. And, the, and in fact, uh, Scarborough has the lowest mill rate in Cumberland County. And uh, I recognize the pain of people here, but uh, I think the blame should go where it belongs, which is toward the state government, and particularly Governor LePage, who is responsible for the cuts in state aid. Thank you. Next. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Mo Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road. Both my husband, Paul, and I are lifelong residents of Scarborough. Uh, let me start by saying that I don't envy your job as council members, nor do I belittle the important role the council plays in running the town, but I must say that I feel you are all doing a disservice to the townspeople. We need more transparency. Most people in Scarborough, or any town for that matter, do not get enmeshed in all the gory details of town spending. It can sound complicated and um, use all kinds of crazy jargon that people don't really understand. But I think the council and the school board are taking advantage of people's apathy. I'm sure that if the town started to post a weekly page in the leader or the current showing in simple numbers how our money is being spent, you'd see a lot more involvement. Right now, it seems that it's only folks on the council and various boards, a handful of people really, who make up and execute their own agendas without regard to the rest of us on how our money is going to be spent. I want to share a few simple numbers with people here from the capital budget. I have a description here of an entry-level maintenance worker for the town of Scarborough 
who uh, would be responsible for cleaning various bathrooms in the town, um, keeping inventory of cleaning supplies. So this is a, a description on, on the budget um, website. And that entry level position for this um, maintenance worker is $53,000. I'd like that job. I know a lot of people who would like that job. Um, and before you all get glassed over, I want to read a couple of other numbers. Uh, the $25,000 to spend on the signs for Scarborough's brand identity. The $8,000 for shade trees. $16,000 for kitchen cabinets at two fire stations. Another $16,000 for new furniture at six fire stations. $32,000 for new carpeting at the town hall that's showing wear. Um, $103,000 for 110 new desktops, plus 10 extra ones, just in case. $6,000 to side the Marine Warden's shack down at Pine Point. Another $32,000 to replace his five-year-old truck. Another $32,000 to replace the animal control officer's truck. Two street sweepers. Got to have those brand new. One at $295,000 and another at $225,000. Please stay with me. $36,000 to replace 37 tasers because these are five years old. I don't know anyone in Scarborough who's ever been tased. I don't really know why we'd need 37. Um, another 200000 to uh, build a, uh, a nine-foot wall extension at the library. That's not including the 4.15 million expansion proposed for 2016. I know a quick easy cut. Let's stop spending overtime. The $16,000 allocated for the collections department, the 4,000 for the purchasing department, 10,000 for the planning, and the 75,000 for the police department, plus the 45,000 for the holiday cash out for the police department. Could you please wrap it up? You yeah, I three will. Minutes are up. Three and a half. Print all of these numbers in the paper and let the people see where we where we're spending our money. Let's see the change. Let the let's change the ordinance so that the town votes on the entire budget and not just the school. <clears throat> Lastly, after all this spending, you raise our taxes once again, though the plan was for no increase. And now this summer, you have the audacity to raise the beach pass. Why not throw the residents of Scarborough bone and let us go to our own beaches for free? I turn to all of you in the audience and ask you to get more involved. Ask the town to publish the budget line by line each week so we can all decide how we should spend our money. Thank you. Thank you. Next. <clears throat> yep. I would like to remind everybody in the audience, council rules, there's no applauding, please. And if you're going to speak, Speak to the, the, uh, the council and not to the audience. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Karam Durda. I live on 6 mm -hmm. Haystack Circle. I have three kids in the education system, and I'm one of the business leaders in the community of Maine. I'd like to speak on behalf of education. So education, the act of education is the lifeblood of economic development ecosystem here in Maine. Much more urgently so in Maine, where the demographic population is far more disparate a lack of cohesive public policy and education strategy, strategy more prevalent, and the cultural encumbrances of the past are more pointed. For Maine, education is the only answer. What is the act of education? Put aside definitions, the media and the talking heads, and I urge you to listen to your insights. Is there a push from within you to create, to express, to bring to the external world your internal stories? Is there a desire to give birth to a real and functional thing that satisfies a need? Is there a forward-leaningness to bring to bear what your mind says should exist and have value that is validated by the world at large? If so, then you're educating. If you're doing it with a group of people, you have not only agreed to join you on this arduous, Herculean, and absolutely emotionally and financially draining adventure, but also to believe in you, then you're part of the economy. You're doing something very real to move the main economy to the 21st century. For me, to educate is to breathe. There's a certain elemental rhythm to it, a tissue connectivity of what makes us human, a certain velocity of intent, a manifest purity of the goodness in all of us. There's an egalitarianism to it, wherein all of us are equal, 
in the capability of our insides to bring to voice what is important to us. Otherwise, why do it? In this act of education, we will fail, we will strain, we will tire, and we will encounter the darkness that accompanies all of us. But in doing so, we get to the light, and that light is the light of contributing to the movement of our lives from point A to point B, to teach our children that in the doing of something is the doing of their lives. Hence, I implore you to not doom us all to incrementalism. This drip, drip, drip bloodletting of requested funding for our schools. I fully realize the stakes. I hire them. I fully realize the challenges. I overcome them. And I fully realize that at the end of the day, what matters most is the catapulting of our children to a future they can create, one that matters. Be bold. Think valiantly. Perhaps even inspire me and us. And for the sake of all of us, don't bury us with inertia, myopia, and ordinariness. Thanks. Thank you. Next. Hi, good evening. I'm not here with a prepared speech. <laughs> um, my name is Amy Chamberlain. I have three children that are in Blue Point getting ready to go up to the Wentworth, and I'm very concerned. I'm also a past teacher. I'm also the vice president of um, Blue Point's PTA, and I see on a daily basis and know firsthand how much teachers spend out of their own pocket and their own time that they don't get paid for the overtime as we heard earlier. <clears throat> this is very saddening. I've heard people tell me in the last few days that the town council feels that we really need to get, take this money and really cut it from our budgets for our school system. We already have worked with many high numbers to get that down. And I say that because I know how the system works. And what scares me the most is we have a lot of students coming into the school system every year. And I know that can be abundant. And it's abundant because of one thing that I think I would like to remind the board. And if you don't know this here in Scarborough, there are many families who move to Scarborough because you have a phenomenal special ed department. And it's very difficult to let your child go to school knowing the special needs that they have. And I will admit, I have two out of my three, and I have triplets. And I will always stand up here and I will always speak for every child, whether they have special needs or whether they don't. But I can, from experience, tell you the special need budget can take up quite a bit. And knowing, this, knowing Scarborough, there are a lot of children coming up. I used to teach these children in preschool. And you need to make sure the money is there because if you don't, you're going to end up doubling, tripling what you're going to be taking away because it's going to cost the system more. We're going to have to look back into hiring teachers because there's going to be gaps. And there are gaps already. And I see it on a daily basis. I just don't volunteer when it's Teacher Appreciation Week. I'm in there every week because I know what that job is like. And you cut more money, you're cutting the throats of teachers that can't really provide what they need, nor the administrators. I know this is a tough job for the town council, but I want to make sure that my voice is heard and that I don't approve of this. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. Thank you. Next. Ryan Wynn. I'm the town's beach monitoring coordinator. I wanted to introduce myself to council members I haven't met and also send an invitation to Anybody, regardless of your, if you gravitate towards birds or dogs, if you're interested in monitoring our beaches, uh, you can sign up over here, and I'll be in touch in the next couple weeks with more information. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, if that's it, I close the public hearing. Uh, minutes of April 16th. Move approval. Second. All in, is there any uh, errors or omissions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. It's approved. Next, adjustments to the agenda. Um, we're going to move um, the resolution, um, which is scheduled after three public hearings. We're going to move the resolution 1403 to right after order 1437, which is the piping plover ordinance. Um, we're going to be moving um, under old business 1434, which is the school and municipal budget, to um, right after 
the resolution 1403. So that will be. So we'll be taking 1435, 1436, right. and 1437 right after the public hearing. Correct. Okay, so um, with that, um, treasurer's warrants, I've already signed them. So it'll be. Order number 1442 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a new liquor license and a new food handler's license from Bailey's Campground, incorporated for the Little River Grill located at 275 Pine Point Road. All right, this is a public uh, hearing for the uh, food handler's license for Bailey's Campground. Would anybody here like to speak on that? Anyone? Okay, public hearing closed. Wish of the council. All right, uh, do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Any comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay. Order number 1443 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a new liquor license and a new food handler's license from Soul Food Group Scarborough LLC doing business as El Rayo Tuquera located at 245 U.S. Route 1. It's used, right. It was the um, former Cumberland Farms. Right. Right here. I'm not going to try to tackle that last one, but um, <laughs> is anybody here that would like to speak on the food handler's license um, for the new restaurant El Rayo. Anyone? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? Approval. Second. Any comments? I'd like to welcome them to the it's community good. and everybody's looking forward to uh, Joining them for some Mexican food. I didn't oh. see you get it up there. <laughs> Turn your head. How can we give these people a food handle and license <coughs> when they're nowhere near the end of It won't be issued until the occupancy permit is, is given. It will be in conjunction with the <coughs> occupancy permit. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> hey, all those in favor. Okay, passing. Yep. Order number 1444 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from Susan Bailey Cloud doing business as Emma's Eats located at the Heard Park concession at Pine Point Beach. Okay, open this up to public hearing on Susan Bailey Cloud's uh, Emma's Eats. Would anyone like to speak to what? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Motion. Move approval. Second. Any comments? Once again, welcome. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Okay, order number 1435 is a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 604, the Animal Control Ordinance. Okay, anyone like to speak to the Animal Control Ordinance? Yeah. We can Once again, name and address, three minutes. Yep. Good evening, Katie Foley, uh, Three Lucky Lane. Um, so I guess I just want to start with saying, it's, geez, it's been a very long journey <laughs> and for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been many valuable lessons learned along the way. Um, this issue of the Animal Control Ordinance uh, has been one of the most divisive issues this town has ever seen. And your decision and vote here tonight represents months of work from all walks of life and people on all sides of the issue. I just want to recognize Councillor St. Clair, uh, who has played an integral role in that entire journey uh, from that infamous October 2nd night, um, where in fact, if I think about that night, it would have caused Kate and I to be the greatest of adversaries. Um, but, I, but we weren't, <laughs> we aren't at all. Uh, in fact, uh, because we were able to sit and put our egos aside and listen to each other, uh, I, I really commend the work that both her and Councillor Sullivan have done in trying to get us to a true compromise, uh, a compromise that could actually unite this town instead of dividing it. And I still carry that hope. Uh, her goals and mine have been the same, same since December. It was to avoid another referendum. It simply does not have to be that way. 
Uh, so while I've not seen them, I know that she was working uh, with the town manager on drafting some further changes to the off-season restrictions in the winter uh, that are being proposed. I also know that she's devastated that she can't be here to vote on those and fears that in her absence they will not pass. Uh, so I'm, as I'm sure you all know, th their nesting attempts have begun in Scarborough. As of yesterday, as far as I'm aware, there have been no <laughs> eggs laid. This means that even if, if the eggs were laid today, the earliest hatch would take place around June 4th. So there's absolutely nothing preventing you from postponing your vote tonight until your May 21st meeting in the hopes that Councillor Sinclair will be in better health. I think you owe it to her and to the town that if any action or inaction that is taken tonight would be different based on her vote to do exactly that. Uh, and finally, I just want to share uh, what I observed last night at the Old Orchard, uh, Old Orchard Beach Council meeting. Um, it's more clear to me than ever that we need a regional strategy in place um, in order to protect the rights of local municipalities to legislate their own towns. The inconsistency between the state and federal agencies is appalling and in fact unconscionable. They just keep pushing through with no consistency whatsoever in how they work with our towns, which only goes to prove that you actually have more power and control over this entire situation than they do. Um, their ordinance is staying the same. They've been asked to make no changes. I have copies of that, uh, as well as um, what I found an interesting inconsistency in their signage that says dogs must be leashed, and yet their ordinance says their dogs are allowed off leash in the morning and in the evening. Um, and then it also says that you are responsible for your dog's actions. And I would love to see Scarborough take a similar approach. And I did make copies for each of you, which I'll give to Tody to hand out. Thank you. Thank you. Next. <coughs> Hi, my name is Douglas Lundiates, 26 Fowler Farm Road. I'm strongly against further restrictions on dogs at the beaches, especially any of the new proposed winter restrictions. You are considering a new rule which says no dogs on any beach from dusk to dawn. This will replace the existing rule which allows people to walk their dogs on leash <coughs> during those times. I and many others have enjoyed late evening, full moon and starlit beach walks with our leash dogs. Many times it's the only option that we have. In winter, I usually walk my dog on the beach before going to work. It is dark at that time in the morning, and your new rule will prevent me from walking my dog on leash. At lunch times, I will not be able to drive back from work and walk my dog on the beach because you are also considering a new 11 to 2 p.m. <coughs> lunchtime ban for walking dogs on any beach during the winter. When I come home from work in the evening, it is usually way past sunset time. I will again not be able to walk my leash dog on the beach due to the new dust to dawn rule. <coughs> These proposed changes effectively prevent all working Scarborough <laughs> residents from, wa working, from walking their dogs on any beach during the winter months. <coughs> I'm wondering what the real intent is by the council. It is certainly not to defend the piping plover because they would be long gone. <coughs> Please could you... Uh, either drop these proposed changes or at the very least reconsider them for the sake of all the working Scarborough dog owners. It's a small change, huge impact to the lives of many, many people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Randy Kirschbaum, 8 Gunstock Road, and I also would like to speak to the winter restrictions on the dogs on the beaches. Um, I guess I'm just confused about where the winter restrictions came from because originally this issue was about the plovers and there are no plovers on the beaches in the winter. So I don't know what caused this restriction to come about. Um, I have a golden retriever, a nine-year-old golden retriever. And uh, before that, I had another golden retriever. I've lived in Scarborough for 16 years. And throughout that time, I've run my dogs on the beach um, in the winter because golden retrievers need to run. We go to the beach every weekend. I am a working person. I can't do it during the day. And 
because of the short days in the winter and the tides, you have very limited hours in which you can have your dogs on the beach. And with this new restriction, the 11 to 2 restriction, it essentially prevents you from being on the beach with your dog um, during a great many days. And it doesn't seem like it makes any sense. And in, in the entire time that I have taken my dogs to the beach, um, there's no one there in the winter during those hours besides surfers and other people with dogs. So I guess I just don't see why or what the problem is. And also in the entire 16 years that I've had my dogs on the beach, I have never encountered anyone who was anything but welcoming and friendly and pleased to see and meet my dogs. So I understand what's going on in terms of trying to protect the plovers. I understand why there are some restrictions that um, are necessary in the summer to uh, help people enjoy the beaches, but I really would urge you to reconsider the winter restrictions because they seem mostly punitive, I guess, and really don't benefit anyone as far as I can see, anyone or anything. So I urge you to reconsider those. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Liam Summers, Holmes Road. Um, we've been at this for months, and the only constant that's been uh, that we can come to agreement on is that there is no agreement. <laughs> there's no agreement on the facts. There's no agreement on the scope of the problem. And there's no agreement on the size of the resolution. So I'm hoping we can turn this to a different language that maybe we can agree on and make this just a simple math problem. Talking about budgets, let's make this into a third grade math problem that we can all understand. The absolute maximum fine that can be levied against the town of Scarborough for that supposed plover take is $12,000. That's it. Period. Capped. Now let's balance that against how much we're going to spend to avoid paying that $12,000 fine. First and foremost, we're going to hire a piping plover coordinator or a beach coordinator. Sorry, congratulations on the job. Uh, <laughs> At $15 an hour, this equates, and I don't know what you're getting paid, maybe it's more, hopefully it's more, uh, this equates to about $31,500 a year in salary. Then a revised educational program to inform people of the nuances and changes of this ordinance is another five to 10000 for websites, flyers, and educational materials you have to submit all year long. New signage for every one of the beaches, another five to $10,000 there. So where does that leave us? The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Settlement if you agree to it, stipulates that we employ our piper, piping plover coordinator for no less than five years. That equates to $157,000 in salary, assuming no raises along the way. Add that to the signage and the awareness campaigns, which conservatively will be about $20,000, and you've got an estimated spend of $178,000 to change this ordinance. $178,000 to change this ordinance for one bird. Now let's discuss the, the numbers of plovers that are nesting on our beaches. Last year there were six, a total of six. You, uh, the uh, Audubon Society reported six plovers nesting on the Scarborough beaches. That's a spend of $29,666 per bird. What exactly are we buying for our $178,000 plover investment? Do we expect to see plovers multiply tenfold on our beaches? If the plover population doesn't increase, what then? What did we spend $178,000 for? What did we accomplish? This is simply a math problem. It's not something we even need to debate. It's simply a third grade math problem. A spend of $178,000 over five years to save a potential $12,000 fine. It's not a favorable equation for our budget. Any way you look at it, you're spending $178,000 to save $12,000. Now I know this ship has likely sailed and nothing I say here is going to change that because for some reason we feel compelled to meet these demands of U.S. Fish and Wildlife. But if you're claiming that you're doing this to avoid paying this potential fine, you haven't done your math. So I would urge you to stop, think about what we're spending here to avoid this fine, and go back with your pencils and say, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Catherine Rogers, Gorham Road, 373. Um, I don't really have a lot to say tonight. You've heard from me over and over and over again. Uh, if the ordinance changes pass without the most recent amendments that are on the docket tonight, referendum, I suspect, um, I don't like what's been offered for amendments tonight. I think the old ordinance was great. 
uh, but it's better than the last version, certainly, except for one thing, the off-season restrictions. Whichever version of amendments pass, you guys are taking away a lot of off-leash time during the spring and summer, which is unnecessary. But um, because of that, your goal should be to ensure that in the off-season there's always a beach at any time of day for dogs to be on leash. Always. It doesn't have to be every beach, but there should always be a beach in Scarborough in the off-season where a dog can be on off leash any time of day a person wants to bring them. We have three town beaches, and yet all these unnecessary spring and summer restrictions are not enough, apparently. You want to require leashes on all three beaches from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. every single day on all three beaches for the entire off season. And this is in addition to the new restrictions. That is preposterous. I go to the beach quite often in the off season. There is nobody there. There are usually a few dog walkers off leash and on leash, maybe a few people without dogs, but that's pretty much it, horses, surfers, clamors. Um, and the three beaches are big enough that we can all avoid each other as needed, so please don't do this. Um, I also oppose the two dog restriction for voice control. Um, if you have dogs that are on voice control, it shouldn't matter how many you have. If they're all behaving very well and they're on voice control, then I'm not sure why there has to be just two. Um, you know, and then also the uh, word restricted um, in 604-10, uh, from April 1 to Labor Day, dogs shall be restricted in the restricted areas. You don't define restricted. Um, does it mean not allowed, off, uh, not allowed off leash, um, not allowed to play the banjo? Um, you know, restricted is not defined in there, so you may want to deal with that. Thank you. Next. Good evening, Council. Joanne Mahoney, 18 Pillsbury. I would like to address Council tonight on two issues, um, the dog ordinance and how it relates to me and the taxes. As a resident of Pine Point and a highly impacted taxpayer of Scarborough, please reconsider not to create a protected area from Herd Park to the jetty for the chance that plovers may come there. Council is considering another tax increase my taxes, and I can only speak to mine, increased 16.77% in 2012. <laughs> Who in their right mind would accept that increase without pause? Plus now perhaps 5, 6, or 7%. That's 23 to 24% in two years. Yet you're considering imposing restrictions that will for sure impact the value of our homes in the beach areas. When people no longer find these areas welcoming, but the areas that are becoming far too restrictive with all their imposing rules. Protect the plover. This is what this is supposed to be about. What we need right now is a very clear advance warning down at the jetty, 200 feet away. That's not up. Clarity to those from away that this is a true plover nesting area. That's important. We have real concerns about these nests, and it should be about the nests. Stop with the hypothetical protected areas. All kinds of signs are popping up, yet we have not voted yet. Now we're going to put up designated <coughs> protected areas. Thousands come to our shore to enjoy the beaches. Pretty sure they're going to feel this town has gone restriction and crazy, sign crazy. My guess is they will... My guess is we will lose the impact of the signs that we are trying to do a job with. So if this is truly about protecting the plovers, then put the critical signage where the plovers are. That's important. With the proper advance warning, you still have an opportunity to stop the craziness. As for education, I understand and I, can't, I don't have the facts, but a $40,000 painting, it went with school, to go a long way for education with these children. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next. He's getting a... We're, we're getting a microphone for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, my name is Susan Morris, and actually I'm a neighbor of yours from Old Orchard Beach. Um, this is Friday. He's my service dog. And we love to go to Pine Point, to Herd Park. It's just a beautiful, beautiful beach. There's wonderful handicapped <coughs> accessible parking for us. And as a service dog, um, we're trained to, get, to give him exercise by throwing a ball, which is something you can't do on a leash. Uh, as a person with a disability, I can take my cane and walk down at low tide to, to the bottom of the beach and throw the ball for him back and forth. And that gets him the exercise that he requires and he deserves as a working service dog and my partner. Um, with the winter restrictions, uh, I don't know, between, uh, my good time is 10 to 2, by the way. Um, with a disability, it, it takes me a while to get going, and then I nap every day in the afternoon. So I'm thinking maybe there might be one day um, in the whole month we may be able to, to hit low tide during, during the uh, restricted, for me, would be one hour. So I just wanted to bring another viewpoint to the council um, just to let you know how um, the restricted hours could affect um, myself and possibly others uh, like me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Barb Price. I live on Ramsey Terrace in Scarborough, and I wrote you all a letter uh, a week or so ago. And I would first of all like to thank all of you for serving, um, and also Jean Marie, you wrote me back, appreciate it. Kate St. Clair wrote me back a few times. We had a good discussion back and forth, and I'd like to thank her. I would reiterate what <coughs> I mentioned about waiting on any vote or until she's able to voice a concern if it's going to possibly sway the vote. Um, as I said in my letter, I love, I love birds, I love dogs, I love walking at the beach. Um, and I really would love an explanation as to why we think it's important to have these restrictions in the winter. Clearly it's not about the clovers. Um, and, and I think that we all deserve that explanation. So I have nothing else prepared, but thank you very much for your time. Bobby Rovner, 4 King Street, October 24th, 2013, United States Department of Interior. Tom Hall, on, excuse me, town manager on November 7th, <coughs> signed off on this. Once he signed off on this, we put ourselves in a position, and I'm not going to go over all the figures that Liam gave you, because he's absolutely right with all the dollars. But once this was signed off on, the town obligated themselves to $178,000. This did not need to be done. You could have paid the 12 grand fine. So this turns out not to be about the plovers at all. This turns out to be a policy, because we have to do this for at least five years. Many of you probably won't even be on the council in five years. I'll be here in five years. Most of the people here are going to be in five years. We'll still be paying our taxes. So hopefully we can redo this. Now we know that, that if we try to redo this anytime soon, wildlife can come back and hit us with the 12 grand. I would say to you, let them do it. You've already paid them 500 bucks. You've got 11 five to, hand, to, to pass out. We've volunteered to give you the money, and you won't take it. This is more than about plovers. This is about dogs off the beach. This is about restriction of hours. This is about something that's going to ruin or change Pine Point Beach, where I live, for generations to come. I moved here because of Pine Point Beach. I didn't have to come here. 
I didn't have to come here at all. I was very happy living in New Jersey since 1985 in my house. I didn't need to come here. I came here for a better life. I thought I was getting it, and I thought I was getting an easier life without all this nonsense that goes on here. I urge you, I urge you to rescind this. Pay the 12, 11 and a half, and then you won't need an ordinance to change your ordinance. It's just like our neighbors in Old Orchard Beach did not change their ordinance. They accepted the guidelines. Thank you. No applause. Next. Hi, Rob McLaughlin, 29 Vesper Street. I really don't have anything new to add. I just want to be one more voice against the winter restrictions. It's obviously not against the plovers. I, I'm at Higgins Beach every single day. And one of the beauties is the hidden secret. Basically, the beach is empty. And I just have a hard time believing that there's such a large population of residents in Scarborough that are totally intolerant of seeing any dog anywhere they're around them that we would have to impose restrictions. Who? I just don't get it. I don't get where all these people that they can't. It's a huge beach. You don't even see other people. And, you know... There's that many people that can't tolerate any sight of dogs. So I ask you to please reconsider um, and don't go with the winter hours. And again, think about enforcement. What are you going to do? Send a police down to Higgins Beach and slap me with a $100 fine because I'm the only one on the beach with my dog off leash. I mean, do you really want to drive me? I mean, it's just silly. So anyways, thank you. Thank you. Next. Seth Fernald, uh, Maple Avenue, Scarborough. Yeah. Um, just kind of reiterating some of the ideas. Again, one a plover taken in thir- killed in 30 years uh, to necessi- necessitate these needs. I don't agree with that during the in-season. Again, in the off-season, looking at the restrictions from 11 to 2. If that is to protect uh, the people who we haven't heard from who are, are scared of the dogs and jumping on them in the cases where that happens, even in times when dogs are allowed off leash, those dogs who jump on people are not supposed to be on the beach at all. So I don't understand why we're trying to restrict from 11 to 2 the well-mannered dogs and people from being off-leash. At no point should dogs be jumping on people on the beach, whether that's 11 to 2, 2 to 5, or any time. So it's confusing to enact laws to deter the law-abiding people and dogs. That's something I think we should look at. It, it doesn't make sense to kind of double down from 11 to 2, saying whether your dog's behaved, they can't be here, or they're not behaved, they, they can't be here. Again, I just, if, we, if we can look at that, the logic in that, I, I, it, it fails me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone? Uh, Roger Shabbat, 12 Houghton Street. Uh, the last meeting that we, uh, you guys had, a lady came up and asked that the uh, uh, April 1st to Labor Day be extended to at least the 15th of uh, September for dogs uh, off the beach from 9 to 5. And there's a lot of merit to that. If you live at Higgins, uh, our season doesn't end on Labor Day. We have a lot of young folks coming with their babies and they use the beach, like today I was on the beach, and there were two or three or four couples with their young child playing on the sand. I think it would be a good thing uh, to bring it back at least to the 15th of September, if not October 1st. Uh, The other thing I want to bring up, we have plovers on all of our beaches except ferry, and I think it's time for us to put this to an end tonight so that we can protect the plovers that we do have on the beach. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just to follow up, my name is John Flaherty of Black Point Road. We have plovers on all of our beaches, except for ferry, and we haven't imposed any new restrictions. We've already spent quite a bit of money. What's the problem? 
I understand the need to tweak. I understand the need to, to tr satisfy a little bit here, but let's face it. We were posed as a town, as a community, with a, a threat to plovers, and we've responded. We're allowing the IFNW to put signage up. We as a community are talking about this. We've got things set up. If you want to extend the off, uh, the 9 to 5 to you know, April 1st to better monitor the safety of nesting plovers, fine. But we didn't do that this year, and we're on record for a number, record number of plovers. So we can coexist. We're proving it. We're doing it right now. We're doing it here. We're doing it at the beach with our dogs, with the people who are supposedly afraid of dogs. Those of us who are responsible dog owners make sure that we stay away from people. You, you get a look. You know people in town, the scene of the beach frequently. You know, they're not a big fan of dogs. They don't have dogs. We'll steer away. We've got big beaches. And we've got bigger problems. We've got budgets to face. And $178,000, whatever the number that is, can be how many teachers? Could be how many police cars, if that's what we decide to invest in as a town. But instead, your priorities are going to be investing hundreds of thousands of dollars at our expense to avoid $11,000 and $500 in a potential extra fine. We can protect the plovers and we can tell those who are trying to force us to go beyond what is reasonable, IFNW, Fish and Wildlife, whoever it may be, let's tell them we can control our own beaches and we can coexist, birds, dogs, peoples, you name it. We can have a little bit of courage and do that. We don't have to give in. We don't have to roll over and play dead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, I said no applause. How many times do I have to tell you guys? Peace. All right, anyone else like to speak? Wow. Mo Erickson again, Pine Point Road. I'm not involved in all the dog stuff, but it seems like this is a perfect time for you to listen to the majority of people in the meetings that I've been to. I really haven't heard anyone talk about um, going against the majority here. Mostly the, everyone here wants dogs on the beach, so I think this is a, a really a no-brainer for the council to side with the majority, as the council really should do to begin with anyway. Thank you. Thank you. She's already spoken. Hmm? Under this. May I speak yeah. again? No. Anyone else like to speak? Why don't you get one shot? We got a lot. It'll be of, very quick. Look at the room. We've It'll got a lot of people quick, to speak, ma'am. We got we've got we've got a school budget, municipal budget on the agenda tonight. Two people like to speak to. This is it's council rules. The answer's no. All right, all right. Since you're going to be rude, go ahead. I'm not being rude. I feel you are. Please speak. Really? I'm. I want to protect the plover too. Put up the right signage. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? This is what. Anyone else? Close the public hearing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Do I have a motion? I need a motion. To put it on the floor. Not, not an amendment, a motion. Move approval. Okay, thank you. Second. All right. Discussion. Any discussion? <laughs> Any not, I'm going to offer an amendment. All right. In the spirit of compromise, I'd like to offer a series of amendments to the Animal Control Ordinance. Since I offer them as a package and they are detailed, I have prepared a new draft with a reference and suggest we replace the version on the agenda with the draft I have prepared. Amendment passed in first reading shown is in red. Every, uh, there was 30 copies that were put out and I was hoping that everybody would share them amongst each other. So the, uh, on the, fir the first ones that were passed are shown in red. My new amendments offered tonight are shown in blue. To prepare you all for the, uh, <laughs> the 
pain to reading the amendment or for me to read the amendment off uh, is lengthy. So, like I said, copies are available. In summary, I propose simplifying the protected area concept, which I suggest be changed to restricted areas and incorporate this concept into Chapter 604 ACO so it has the weight of an ordinance. Remove the wandering check idea entirely as to uh, it's too complicated to administer and enforce. The restricted area designations for each beach as follows. Higgins Beach line will be Champion Street to the river. Ferry and Western beginning at the point of the Pine, um, the uh, Prout's Neck Association ownership on Ferry Beach. It's extending around the Ferry Rock and the full length of Western Beach. Now this is a uh, property that the town does not own and does not control. At Pine Point Beach, main beach access path at Heard Park to the jetty. Restricted area affected from April 1st to the day after Labor Day each year. In restricted area, no dogs are allowed at Higgins and Ferry, Western and dogs on leash, that's on leash only, at Pine Point to allow beachfront homeowners the ability to traverse the beach to the, uh, to the, unrestricted, the uh, unprotected areas. Maps of the restricted areas are incorporated into the ordinance attached as exhibits. So um, that would clear up the problem that everyone had with the, um, uh, the resolution. Um, these amendments provide opportunities for year-round for dogs to be off-leash on the three beaches in Scarborough. The restricted areas designations are based on document historical data. By establishing them, we are providing protec protection in the specific areas where plovers are known to locate. The restricted areas, coupled with better signage, increased enforcement, and the hire of seasonal beach monitoring coordinator and the enhanced monitoring program, I believe we are providing reasonable and appropriate protection and thereby limiting the potential for further incidents. Although we are not certain of the circumstances under, of the action, as it relates to the settlement agreement and the $12,000 fine, I suspect there will be some, but in the end, we need to ultimately respect the will of our residents. I believe these amendments strike the appropriate balance for our beaches. So I hope everybody will join in supporting um, these amendments on the council and there as red in this document in blue. Need a second. Okay. So with that being said, I need a second. Second. Discussion. Oh well. I guess I'll jump in. I'll, I'll be the <laughs> sacrificial lamb. Um so I, I have to say I do like this a lot better. This this was <clears throat> something I had talked about before. I think it adds a lot of clarity. Um, I thought it was probably going to be impossible to chase wandering chicks around and figure out who was what and where. Um, I think, again, the nice thing is is this pins points um, sections of each beach, both at Higgins, at Ferry, and at Pine Point. There are more than half the beach areas that are available to the public. Granted, um, we'll still have some regular, normal summer rules that we usually have, which are, you know, during the height of the day, you can't be there with your dog. Um, you still have your off-lease um, off time in the morning. But again, it'll be a black and white. You walk onto the beach, and you're going to see clearly there's a sign. If you're over here, your dog needs to be on a leash at Pine Point. If you're that way, you can be off-leash. And unfortunately, it, as much as I, I, I think it was <coughs> poor taste, for Fish and Wildlife to, to post some of the signs they did. It's a prime mm -hmm. example of it's not an area we control. Um, certainly there are the lion's share of the nests are in that area, but it's 
private property, like anything, you can do whatever you want with your private property. So, um, again, those two areas don't really make or break. It's Pine Point, like I said, is the big one, and, and it creates a nice, clear delineation. Um, it preserves some off-leash time. And all in all, I guess, wrap up with I'll support it. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, Council of Blaze. Can I propose changes to this? This has to be voted first. Um, we have to, to be taken care of We have of to first. vote on the amendment first. Okay. My, my amendment, and then we can offer others. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Councilor Katerina. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Councilor Holbrook. This has been a, a long process. Um, I also was happy to see that we aren't going to worry about chicks wandering and how we're going to keep track of chicks and boundaries and whatever. Um, I, I do know that there's been a concern about the winter hours, uh, and my, my answer to that is we do hear from a number of people other than people who show up here. Um, and while I don't agree with the actual hours that are posted, um, I, and I, I've been wavering back and forth on this, but uh, the reason it's in there is not for plover protection. It's for people who'd like to be on the beach and not have any, you have to worry about dogs, and we're only asking for the dogs to be on leash for a limited amount of time. So that's what's been put out there, and that's why it's put out. But I know that was raised, so I'm just answering that question. Um, so anyway, that's my. Yeah. All right, I'll just put. Um, Jim. I, pardon me? Oh, Jim. <laughs> yes, Jim. I always forget Jim. <laughs> I have two things that I'd, I'd like to put in here, whatever, to, however we're supposed to do it. One would be with the commotion, et cetera, on the winter hours. I can see all the aspects, but I would like to see the winter hours changed to be 10 to 12, mm. which is giving people a little less time, but it's also spreading up. It seemed to be a major concern was the temperature in the course of the day. Although anybody that follows weather knows that the warmest part of the day is 2 o'clock. Mm. Stating the hours back to 11, uh, 10 to 12, hopefully we'll bring a compromise that would be happy. And the other, I think, will have to be taken up individually, is I would see the, the latter date going to all the dates in here that say, September 1st, go to September 15th. Okay, thank you. That being said, um, usually I don't um, read from notes, but it was complicated um, and lengthy um, addition to the, what we already had last time. So I met, I, I, vet, I met and talked with a lot of dog, uh, dog owners in Scarborough and listened to the concerns and took notes and listened to everybody at the podium. And I went back to work on this for weeks upon weeks and um, discussed it and came to the best compromise that I thought I could make um, on, on the amendments, for an amendment. And uh, this is what I came up with, and I'm hoping that uh, my fellow counselors agree that it's a better compromise. Um, what I call threading the needle, uh, trying to come between um, people that walk on the beach and people that um, have dogs and uh, people that want pro uh, plovers protected. So with that, um, if there's, is there any other comments? Okay. All those in favor? Of the amendment. Of the amendment. Opposed? One. Yeah. Okay, with that being said, any further amendments? I have an amendment I'd like to offer on behalf of Kate Sinclair, who could not be here this evening. Um, she had an amendment to what would be now our new version of the ordinance um, in reference to the winter hours. 
request would be to change May 14th to November 30th. I'm sorry, I'll read the line. From the day after Labor Day to November 30th, dogs on leash from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. From December 1st to March 31st, dogs allowed under voice and sight control. And that's in the form of a motion. I'll second. I'm just handing out uh, a, a written copy of the amendment just so it's clear for everyone. Okay. We have a motion on the floor, a second. Discussion. Councilor Benedict. I, th I think that, <coughs> excuse me, having different dates in 30, 60, 90 different places <coughs> is going to confuse the dickens out of anybody coming into town and the people that live here. I think that whatever the regulation for the winter is, it's what it should be. Thank you. Councilor Donovan. The ad hoc committee took this up, and uh, I think seven to nothing uh, agreed to have one set of times for the whole off season, from Labor Day to May 15th. Uh, in, but I don't think it was based on the concept that winter couldn't be different. It was more based upon the fact that we didn't want to layer another set of rules on it. I have heard from people on both sides, people who have fears of dogs or medical issues uh, and, and really don't use our beaches uh, in the winter when it's the only public place in, in the community that doesn't have snow and ice on it. Uh, uh, but I also understand that 11 to 2 seems to me to be unnecessarily restrictive and it falls in the middle of the day. So. While I won't support this motion, which would exclude it entirely uh, uh, from people who would like a limited period of time, I would be willing to make an, uh, uh, an, a motion to amend to reduce the hours and move them out of the kind of lunchtime period of time uh, if this motion were to not pass. Thank you. Oh, I'll talk. Um, you know, I, I do support it. I, I think I can probably read where it's going to land for, for votes. But um, I think the, the concept that Kate had w was a good one, which is it takes care of that window of, you know, you're in the fall. It's that nicer weather. Maybe we still need to keep, you know, um, some time slots for walkers that might not want to be, you know, um, in the with dogs around, um, but it's certainly at that November 30th, after that, um, from December 1st right up through, you know, through the winter season, um, it would allow, allow for them, with, and, and I can support that. I see what you're saying. I, I mean, I appreciate there, there's a time when people want to walk. Um, I, I know my own, <laughs> my own grandmother said she wanted time to walk on the beach without having to be worried about being knocked over and breaking a hip. Um, but, but certainly, I, I, I agree, you know, I, I go down to the beach, I've spent a lot of time popping in this winter just to kind of see what's what and, you know, put my eye around a little bit, and, and it's true, there's not a lot of bodies on the beach come, you know, January and it's 20 below, uh, <laughs> power to them, but um, I, I support it, I thought it was a good idea, um, but that's it. Okay. Council Catherine, do you have anything? No, I'm okay. no, no, at this point. Once again. Okay. Um, uh, Council of St. Clair was, is devastated that she can't be here. Um, and she really wanted to see this amendment go through. Um, so I, I, um, I am supporting it. I, I see that the need for maybe some hours um, up until the end of November um, but after that, I, I really don't see the need for it because I think this, uh, the beach is thin right out and there's not a lot of, um, lot of people walking on the beaches in the late cold winter days. And uh, so with the amendment that uh, Kate presented, I thought was um, 
very insightful and um, you know, uh, got right to the point that the issue that we've heard from people tonight, we've heard emails from people saying the same thing. So I am going to support this amendment. And um, is there any further comments? I hope uh, my council, fellow council, is joined in the same opinion. Council Blaze. Well, I agree with, with Bill. Um, I think we've got to have time. Uh, year-round for people that do not want to be harassed by dogs. Uh, and we asked uh, folks, we didn't do that when you were up at the podium talk, and please be respectful of the council as we're debating this between ourselves. You're welcome here to watch us talk about the issue. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead. Council I realize please. that in the wintertime, there aren't that many people down at the beach, and they're not. I mean, it's not like in the summertime. But when you're down there and dogs come tearing up to you, and if you don't want a dog to come running up to you, you don't have any control over it. And I know that there's some people in this town that have, um, you know, it's not only people that have disabilities or anything like that. Some people just don't want to be bothered by dogs. Uh, a woman mentioned to me uh, about a week ago that she's got a, a child that is allergic to all types of dogs and a really, really serious allergy. And, you know, if the dog comes running up to that child, that could be extremely dangerous. Um, and it's, you know, I just don't understand why people that have dogs have to feel like they have to be loose all the time. What's wrong with going down to the beach and putting the leash on the dog and walk on the dog? I just don't understand it. I can't support this. <clears throat> Thank you. Councilor Caterina. Yeah, um, I'm sitting here and I've been given quite a bit of thought to it and um, at this point I would not support this amendment either and the reason for that is I think what's what's pushing me towards it is I'd, I'd, I'd like to see a more consistent time frame I don't necessarily want to see an 11 to 2 I'd like to see something else and I think I would support Councillor Donovan and his amendment Council Benedict <coughs> I would not support this for a couple of reasons. One is just pure logic that we in our life can only understand so much some of the time. And we're going to turn around and we're going to have signs all over the place, which is more money and unnecessary because I think it should just be a set, whatever the time is, the time, that's what the time should be the balance of the time so people don't have to be checking anything for oh my gosh can I bring the dog to the beach today whatever it is is fine but I, 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 I don't think splitting the year up even more uh, it doesn't make sense to me thank you thank you last round anyone else okay with that the motion on the floor is from December 1st to March 31st, dogs allowed under voice and sight control. Um, from November 30th, dogs are on leash from 11 to 2. All those in favor? Opposed? Doesn't carry. Okay. Is there any further amendments? Councillor Donovan. Uh, so that we can deal with this one, and, I, and it is my belief that this should be shortened. Uh, I'm, I'm not wed to times of day, but I'll just make a motion to amend, and, uh, and we can debate it. Uh, okay. I'm uh, moving to amend section 604-10. Uh, uh, 
subparagraph C and adding the words at the end of paragraph uh, C, uh, uh, except from December 1 to March 31, dogs on leash from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Can you repeat that one more time, please? <clears throat> adding to the end of paragraph yep. C of 60410, uh, uh, and this acts as an exception to the general rule, which is the 11 to 2, which falls in the fall and then in the spring, uh, except from December 1 to March 31, dogs on leash from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. One to three. Two of them. Okay. Discussion. Uh, Council uh, Blaze. No. Oh, so wait, just a moment. Let, let me just say that uh, uh, I think two hours, given that they're short of number of daylight hours, is is quite appropriate. Uh, I wanted to move it out of the lunchtime. Uh, I did not want to move it to the beginning of the day when I, who live at Higgins Beach, see dog walkers at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Uh, and some people show up at lunchtime because they take that op opportunity to walk their dogs. So it essentially restricts the time period to either the middle of the morning or the, the middle of the afternoon. So I just chose one to three based on the fact that uh, the, a lot of the people who I've heard from who uh, uh, would like to not be put at risk of dogs off leash were older people. Uh, and therefore, I figured the middle, uh, you know, one to three was probably a better time of day uh, for seniors. Otherwise, uh, I probably didn't really have much of a reason to pick one to three, other than that it also winters are cold, and so one to three was a little bit warmer than in the morning. Okay, Thank you. Um, first of all, we need a second on the floor second. on the amendment. Second. Okay. Okay. Council Benedict, uh, you were next, and then you, did you second that? Yes. Okay. Count. Um, Katerina, though. I'm confused. Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> through the chair. Um, yep. Councilor Donovan. Um, so what are you saying we're doing from Labor Day to whatever? So. Here? Labor Day to uh, the last day of November, it would be 11 to 2, the fall, just as it's as sub, sub paragraph C is presently written. Uh, uh, this exception to sub paragraph C would then kick in from December 1st to March 31st. Uh, uh, it would then, uh, because it accepts out only the period December 1 to March 31, you would then pick up on April 1st with the 11 to 2 period that would then run through May 14th, as, as it's presently written. And that's why I framed it the way I did. Okay. Councilor uh, Katerina? I, uh, first of all, I think the language is a little messed up here, but um, we can fix that. Um, I, I would ask Councillor Donovan if he would, through you, through the chair, Yes. if um, he would, I, I can't, m the reason I didn't vote for the other amendment was because I wanted to see something consistent. So I would, I would say if we're going to do the one to three, then do the one to three in the time period that's outside of whatever. I know that's not very technical with, with dates, but. Uh, I would go for the 1 to 3, not not do the 11 to 2, but do 1 to 3 as opposed to 11 to 2. Either or. Yeah. Either or, Either or yeah. So I, I... Throughout the entire period of time. Right. Yeah, because right now C says, from the day after Labor Day to May 14th, dogs on leash from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., I would suggest that that be from 1 to 3, if that's what the hours were that we decided on. That would be an easy way to uh, do that. If that was the will of the council, I wouldn't have okay. any objection to it. But I guess I 
discussion would take place right. through the chair. Right. I I heard um, I heard the same comments coming from Council Blaze on the last one um, as far as being consistent with signage and stuff. You want to speak to that, Council Blaze? Or well, I I kind of agree with Dean Murray that uh, let's just have one period. Let's and I kind of like the period. It's a little bit afternoon and it's not smack dab in the middle and but let's make it consistent all the way through okay <clears throat> council benedict i agree i think it's going to be consistent with yeah. the end of the summer cut beginning of the summer cut okay thank you council <coughs> holbrook Just ditto so we're going to stay consistent one to three we could have to change his motion. Right, right. No, I'm just no, no. I understand that. I'm just. Uh, uh, Councilor Donovan just asked for like a consensus of the council, so I think I'll I'll, I'll just weigh in too because um, um, the I meant I supported Councilor St. Clair's uh, amendment, um, and even whatever we can get, this I think this amendment's you know um, is better than what's on the books, going to be on the books now. Um, so it, yeah, I mean, it, this is all what it's about, trying to work through compromise and come to a conclusion on something. If we can't, if we can't come to a consensus on doing away with the winter hours um, or changing to what Council of St. Clair wanted, then I would, I would also um, support the, um, one to three from Labor Day on. That, that's my two cents. So I think you have a consensus, and if you want to... Uh, if, if I may, I'd like to be able to uh, withdraw my motion and Can restate it. Withdraw the second? Second. Yes. Oh, sorry. He's okay. Yes. Try to uh, go on it again. Uh, 60410C <laughs> would read uh, from the day after Labor Day, dogs on leash from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. So you're taking out to May 14th. To May 14th. All right, so let me read it again. From the day after Labor Day to May 14th. Versus what the summer Dogs on leash from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. you got two weeks in there with nothing. Just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. Um, that's the motion. That's second. the motion we have to do. We got a second from Council Blaze. Discussion, Council of Benedict. Why do you have the 14th? The only thing I'm modifying in subparagraph C, as it was presented by uh, the chairman's amendment at the beginning of this discussion, is the hours. The uh, uh, amendment that was submitted by the chairman had the time period running from the day after Labor Day to May 14th. And so the only change would be in the hours uh, from 11 to 2, strike that and substitute from 1 to 3 p.m. Yeah, I okay. I'll, he um, let's see. Councillor um, Benedict, I believe, is talking about the April 1st, de you know, uh, plover season. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's. I think that's what you're referring to, correct? So what it is, is is April 1st will establish the protected areas. Well, we have two weeks of limbo out there. Oh. No. Yeah. no, no, no. Well, I'll let you explain that. Yep. The, uh, uh, the uh, time periods really break into two time periods. One starts May 15th, uh, and that's really the summer time periods, and it runs through Labor Day. And, and that covers the off-leash in the morning, 
9 to 5 in the day, uh, no dogs on the beach, and then dogs on leash during the evening. That ends on Labor Day. The day after Labor Day, which we pick up here, runs all the way around back to May 15th, ends on May 14th. So you've got a, a full year covered uh, okay. with the in-season rules that we're all familiar with, and now this off-season rule, which would be to reduce the number of hours and change it to from three hours to two hours and put it in the afternoon <coughs> at 1 to 3 p.m. Doesn't actually relate to the uh, the plover uh, uh, the plover period, and it, and, it, and it doesn't have to has to. Okay. Satisfying? Or no. Yep. Okay. Um, anyone else? Okay. Just to, um, for me, as far as clarification, the um, the winter hours which uh, would be a little down to two now uh, for people that want to go to the beach um, and not be disturbed by dogs, okay, uh, off leash. Um, has nothing to do with the, the plovers, I understand that, but we have the animal control ordinances open and we've had people that come came to the council meetings and uh, express their concern, and we're trying, trying the best we can to meet everybody's concerns. And uh, you know, and that's where coming to um, when I offered my amendment, trying to uh, come to a decent compromise, because not all seven of us agree on the issue. So um, some ways we got to, you know, find something in the middle we can agree on, or. <coughs> Pass. So, with that, is there any others? Any other comments before we vote? Okay. Um, I'll have the clerk read the amendment off again. Were you prepared to? Or? It, the change would be um, from in section 604-10, subsection C, from the day after Labor Day to May 14th, dogs on leash from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Is there any other amendments? Yes, I yep. well, Council Blaze got the. I that. think we've got the same one. Okay. Uh, Council Blaze. The. I'd like to change the this Labor Day date to. Uh, September 15th. What section and subsection are you it's referring a, it's to? It's spread out throughout this whole thing. Every time it says Labor All Day, days. it should be September 15th. Uh, okay. 15th. Every, strike every word mentions that yep. in the ordinance. Okay. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, Council Benedict, second. Council discussion. Well, the re mm. the right. reason. The reason is that um, the summer doesn't end on Labor Day. And I think you can go down to any beach the day after Labor Day, and it's going to be just like Labor Day or two days before Labor Day. There's a ton of people still vacationing in town, and we have to be uh, cognizant of that fact, and uh, we have to uh, make sure the dogs aren't running loose on the beach while it's crowded. Sorry about that. Now, can you hear it? Okay. The, the, reason, the reason being uh, people are, the beaches are really crowded the first two weeks in September. There's a lot of people vacation after kids get back into school. People with young kids that are preschool, older people. Um, and it's, it's just not fair to have dogs running loose at that point in time. So I just want to move it out two weeks, and that's it. Okay, Council Benedict. I agree with Council Blaze. Uh, also in congestion <coughs> with the gentleman that spoke to Rentas. 
um, and the little children with the young families. I think you really, if we don't pass this, we'll really be cutting off <coughs> some money to people that have had renters all along and should be allowed to continue to. So I will support this measure. Motion. Thank you. <coughs> uh, anyone else? I guess I'll uh, Holbrook. just going to chime in. I, I don't really have anything of value to add to the discussion other than um, I, I think we've made a lot of changes to, to this ordinance at this point. Um, I, although I appreciate the position in, in, your, in your point, um, I think for myself, I'm comfortable <sighs> with where things are at, and, and I would just prefer to see things go for a year or so and see how, how it Mm -hmm. all shakes out. Um, I get your point, you know, another two weeks. I don't know, in the same token, throw, throw them a bone and, <laughs> you know, let them have their dog on the beach, too. So, um, I, I, I won't support it. I get your point, but, but I, I won't support it. Councilor Kettering? Um, my thinking is I would just, I, I also understand, you know, that beaches can be crowded till September 15th, particularly if the weather's nice, but to me, Labor Day is an easier date for people to remember. It's pretty clear it's Labor Day. <laughs> so, Council Blaze. I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, September 15th is the date that's currently in the ordinance. So that would be a no change, really. <coughs> Anyone else? Where's the. All right. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. One of the things I heard a lot is, uh, you know, hours, taking hours, time away from um, dogs going to the beach. So, unfortunately, I would not be in favor of this amendment. Um, and uh, I guess that's the way I'm going to leave it. So, if there's no other comments, he said. Um, all those in favor? Three. All those opposed? Three. The motion fails. Okay, once again, amendments. Any other amendments? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next. Main motion. I'm, in, I'm sorry. Main motion. <laughs> Thanks, it's been a long okay. one. Main motion as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? Jim opposed. Okay. On to the next. Order 1436 is the second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 604A, the horse speech permit. Okay. Um, is there anyone here tonight that would like to speak to the... Horse Beach Permit Ordinance. Anyone? Okay, mm -hmm. seeing none. Public hearing closed. I meant, well, <laughs> not public <laughs> hearing. Comments closed. Okay, um, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Comments? Any comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Order number 1437 is the second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 610, the Pipe and Clover Ordinance. Is there anyone here that would like to speak to the Piping Clover Ordinance? Step up the mic, three minutes, name and address. Liam Summers, uh, Holmes Road. You know, I was mistaken. After hearing from this council, I now fully understand that our beaches are places where the massacre of protected species occurs daily and wild packs of roving dogs are mauling the citizens at a record pace. I can only imagine the reams of police reports that must have been filed last year alone about this. At the pace these attacks have been occurring, I'm surprised, honestly, that there's this many Scarborough residents left to attend these meetings. 
This council has resorted time and time again to the time-worn we're hearing from a silent major minority at every turn. What about the majority? Mr. Blaze, you asked, why do dog owners feel their dogs should be free to be off the leash at all times? I'm confused by this. Because the last time I checked, I can't have my dog off the leash on any beach, any time other than 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. That's three hours. There's 24 hours in a day. Again, let's go back to math. That's 21 hours left. From 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., you can't even have your dog on a beach, leashed or otherwise. Yet this is still not enough time to satisfy those folks who don't want to be, uh, you know, bothered by dogs. So am I to understand that the three hours I'm granted off leash time of my dogs is such a huge imposition to this silent minority that you're intent on serving who already get the benefit of 21 hours a day of dog-free beach use that my taxes also support. The real issue here is a privileged minority, some of which are represented on this board, are intent in creating their own private sanctuaries out of our beaches. And frankly, it is time for the citizens of this town to understand what's at play here. And I think I'm a reasonable person, and I'm trying to be a reasonable person. I think I'm a common sense person, and I think I've proposed common sense solutions that this could have been solved months ago. But I have hardly seen such a convoluted set of regulations that accomplishes nothing and other than wasting our tax dollars to fulfill the wishes of a very few privileged citizens. You've taken a reasonable ordinance that was already in place and you've created a monstrosity of epic proportions that nobody here in this room understands what you're talking about and nobody that comes into this town is going to understand what you're talking about. And instead of a friendly town of Scarborough beaches that we have all moved here to enjoy, we're now going to be signage everywhere. It's going to look like a Jersey freeway about where you can go, what you can do, what time of day, what time of year, how short your lease should be. That's not why we moved here. In conclusion, I hope you each get the support, the full support, of the minority that you're serving tonight. Once again, I'll remind everybody we're talking about the Plover Ordinance, not about the leash of the dog ordinance, the Plover Ordinance, strictly. Well, my name's Robert Rovner, 4 King Street. I might, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm what you just said, I'm, I'm in the right pew. But I'll just say that by going to 1 o'clock, from 1 to 3, mm -mm. a lot of people no. here who work. Excuse me, Plover Ordinance. The dog, and when uh, they, I'm speak about it and as... when they get off from work... Uh -huh. Sir, I'm Plover. Gonna, please let me finish, Mr. Not Senator. unless you're going to talk about Plovers. I am talking about Plovers. There are none there. Thank you. From 1 to 3, December, January, February, March, there are no Plovers. And yet there are a lot of people here who get off from work. By the time they get home, it's already dark. It starts getting dark 4 or 5 o'clock. By the time they get home and get down to the beach, they're not allowed on the beaches any longer. I don't know what you folks have done. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone else like to speak to the Plover Ordinance? Seeing no one? Now, in public mm -hmm. comment, do I have a motion? Move adoption. Second. Second. Discussion. Uh, I think I just would offer that um, what we're talking about right now, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to bring my page back up. <laughs> um, th this section had to do. Um, and the only change that is significant in this part is um, there were two words being added, um, which was um, no person shall engage in kite flying, which is already our current rule, um, and then kite surfing or parasailing. Um, so just so that everyone's clear of what we're talking mm -hmm. about, that, that's the only change to this portion of the ordinance that we're dealing with. Yeah, oh, yes. no. that's correct. Yeah, just clarity. That, that's all. 
<laughs> looking for Those a little the clarity. Only changes. Yep. But she just, yeah, no. Any, anyone else? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. All those in favor? Let's vote. Resolution 1403 is act on the request to approve the resolve to create protected beach areas. This item had been tabled from the April 2nd, 2014 Town Council meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Discussion. Do I have a second? Do I hear a motion? Second? Second. Okay. Discussion. If I'm not mistaken, this is the resolution with the graphs, so... Um, we have to, we have to defeat it. Oh, yeah. um, right, we'll just, right. It's okay. technicality. Thank you. Um, it's um, it's going to get voted down. It's no longer valid. So um, is there any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the resolution? All those opposed? It goes down. Okay, um, we're going to take a 10-minute recess, and when we come back, we're going to do the municipal school budget. 10-minute recess. Thank you. My brain is, like, fried. Oh. Okay. Go for it. Some reason they turned my mic up. Hello. <laughs> Once again, I apologize for the lengthy uh, break. Once again, the media. <laughs> Wait, you want to get their stories in at 11. Wow, that thing is loud. Okay, we're going to start. Yep. Okay, I call the meeting back to order. Don't be smart. Order. No, do it. Yes, please. Uh, order 1434 is second reading on the proposed municipal school budget for fiscal year 2015. Okay, um, we're going to go with uh, comments from the public. And first, um, Chris Chiazzo would like to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Councilors. I know it's been a very long night, so uh, hopefully we can do this rather quickly, but um, efficiency is probably more important. 
So first allow me to say that I've uh, seen a noticeable improvement in the communication between our two groups this year. Um, while there's always room for greater cooperation, I hope you'll agree that most, for the most part this year, it's been a very positive and encouraging, uh, and the citizens of Scarborough should be pleased with the progress we've made in this area. Whenever possible, I've tried to consistently convey the School Board Finance Committee's commitment to providing the resources necessary to continue small, incremental investments and restoration to school programs. In contemplating a potential reduction in the school budget, it seems unfortunate that after some of the most productive work we've had in years between the Town Council and the School Board, that the Town Council would then consider any random and or unilateral cuts to this budget, particularly after understanding the thoughtful analysis of student needs done by the School Leadership Council and the careful and analytical vetting of the budget by the School Board Finance Committee. In the spirit of such open communication, I want to be transparent and forthcoming about the School Board Finance Committee's approach to a reduction in this budget. Our response will be to protect the momentum of improvements we see happening across all of our schools, which means that rather than reduce the proposed investments and restorations in the school board's approved budget, we will instead choose to step back on other commitments whose importance are all well understood. For example, a targeted reduction of the overall budget to achieve a 3.75% level increase of the tax rate would require us to reduce the school department's tax request by over $452,000. To achieve this, we would, against our preference and inconsistent with best practices for responsible fiscal management, further reduce our undesignated fund balance to levels of several years back by allocating an additional $200,000 of that fund balance as physical year 2015 revenues, leaving us with a projected fund balance of around 1% of our budget when best practices targets a 3% level. Then, instead of following through on making adjustments to adequately fund our school's nutrition program, again, a topic we've had detailed conversations about, we will return to the current fiscal year 14 funding level, knowing that this will again remain inadequate. We will count on structural changes made to our contracted health insurance funding to optimistically deliver better than projected savings and reduce our health care budget by just under $100,000. And we will resort again to underfunding and making reductions in supplies, materials, and equipment purchased for classrooms across the district. Are these easy choices? No. Are we cutting fat? No. But if tough choices need to be made, Continuing the work, the ongoing work, with small but essential rebuilding is, in the final analysis, what will best serve our students. If the school budget is reduced below the level needed to achieve a 3.75% tax increase, we will still make all of these changes and then begin the almost impossible task of cutting into the bone. Starting with choices about delaying essential English language arts initiatives, not restoring critical staffing levels in world language art and music, and increasing our reliance on parent funding of athletics. Cuts at any level will force us, in order to protect existing programming, to forego any investments and structural changes that would, in the long run, create efficiencies in the delivery of effective student instruction. Not to mention the types of investments that would move us forward in STEM and technology, areas where we will continue to lose more ground in relation to other school districts across the state and in the U.S. as a whole. In my humble, albeit biased opinion, I believe the Board of Education provided the Council with an informed and fully vetted budget that balances the critical needs of our students with our fiduciary responsibility to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money. The next step lies with you this evening. We've made great progress building the bridges of trust and communica communication between our two independent governing bodies during this budget cycle. Making arbitrary and unilateral cuts to this budget will not only have a negative impact on those efforts, it will have a negative impact on the education of our children and only continue to polarize our town. I beg you, please respect the work done by the Board of Education, accept the school budget as presented in its entirety and without modifications. Please respect the due process and let the people decide. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the public, Three minutes, name and address, please. Robert Rovner, 4 King Street. I haven't spoken on this topic in seven years when I first moved here. Got a little bit. Town is just frustrated. 
made tremendously. I sat at the work, workshop last week, and one of the things that stuck in my mind when the chairman asked Mr. Cayazo, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, when this could be flat, he was unable to answer you. When he was asked what to do, he said, send it to the town for a vote. As I said before, you folks are the board of directors here. We are the shareholders. You have a fiduciary responsibility to all of us, and that includes the school. I came from a town of 40,000. There were eight grammar schools, two junior high schools, and a high school. We were the model community for education in this country in the 1950s when I went to school. I understand the importance of this. I took Spanish for four years, my sister took French. We both went to college, we both have master's degrees. I understand all this. It seems to me that perhaps this budget needs to be looked at in a different way. And maybe there are some administrative responsibilities here that can be looked at. Number one. Number two, I'm not sure why because I didn't vote on this, and I don't know anything about it. But the Wentworth School, $39 million budget for 700 kids. When I look at the plan upstairs, administrative offices seem to be moving upstairs. They spent $40,000 on a piece of art. I don't know what the art is. I just don't understand that. They're broke. They want education. They want language department. But they spent $40,000 on a piece of art. Now, the council has to approve their budget first. So I very much appreciate the cuts that were mentioned this evening. However, the increase, and then it was posed last week by Mr. Hall that the people voted on it, all of this. Well, you're absolutely right, the people did vote on this. And the people vote because they believe you. And you tell them that they need a bond issue. You need a bond issue. Town needs a bond issue. It isn't explained to them that by passing the bond issue and by passing these budgets, what it's going to mean to their taxes. Now, I would hope in the last three years people have woken up because you've got a 5.9% increase in taxes, 7.03, and you're looking at anywhere from, from 78 to 8%. And I'll just say two more things. Thank you. In the forecaster, Southern forecaster, school budget, budget leaves 10 combined new full positions, of which only five are actual full-time full -time jobs requiring new hires. And I'll remind you again what I said before. Nothing is easier, easy, easier than the expenditure of public money. Nothing is. We all know that. It doesn't appear to belong to anybody. It just comes out of thin air. The temptation is overwhelming to, be, to bestow it on somebody. We are not going to get any more money from the state. We're not going to get any more money from the feds. We are in a state, a poor state, of a million and a half people with two electoral votes. We're running at a $17 trillion deficit, and in 10 years, if it continues, we'll be at 24. We're not getting any money. We need to take care of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cindy Kuick, and I live at 2A Moores Point Road. Uh, I understand that there's a number of people here who are in favor of the proposed budget, and I understand that there's a number of people who are against the budget. And as residents of the town, we all have our reasons for that. Um, I know that I have come out on the elections and I have voted for our school board. And they have spent countless hours doing research and making decisions to put together the best budget that they feel <coughs> our town needs. And I respect that and that is why I voted or didn't vote for people on our school board. The residents now have a right to vote on that budget. However, the town council apparently feels that they can make a better decision than the residents of this town. And all I'm simply asking is that we give our school board the respect that they deserve 
and the time that they've spent researching and developing this and give the residents of the town the respect that they deserve because I think we're all intelligent people and we can make decisions and do research and we should be allowed to do that. So I would like the proposed budget to remain as it is, have it go to a vote to the residents of this town, and allow us to make a decision. Maybe it'll pass, maybe it won't, but at least then the citizens of this town will be speaking. And that's what I think we should be doing. Thank you. Good evening. It's a long one. My name is Jacqueline Perry. I live at 215 Black Point Road. I purchased my home in Scarborough in 1970. I'm not a Scarborough native, but I am a Maine native from Bangor. I taught school for 22 years. I've had various jobs since I retired as a teacher. I still work 12 hours a week. I'm going to be 77 years old and feel great. I've been working since I was 14. Only missed one summer because my mother had an operation. So I know what it means to work. I know what it means to buy a home. I know what it means to pay taxes. I know what it means to be retired. My retirement income is not enormous, but my house is small. I own my house, and I'm very fortunate. I bought in Scarborough because I could afford to buy in Scarborough when I was a teacher in Portland. This is a great community. So let me tell you some things. Number one, the $40,000 in that budget for art is not being paid for by you. It was not in the budget that you voted on for the school. That money, that $40,000, is being raised to buy a brick. $50, have a brick outside, have your name on it. That's what we're doing to pay for the art. If it was a state project, 1% of the budget would go for art, and the state would have covered it, but it's not. Parents in this town spend close to $500,000 a year outside of the school budget to fund school activities. They also, part of that money also goes to buy jackets and bags and things of that sort that the school wouldn't buy anyway, and we know that. Part of the budget this year was to try and fund more of the ice time and swim time pool time, I should say, but we can't do that yet. We can't even afford in this budget to pay for ice time and pool time for our students, let alone increase some of the programs that we wanted to increase. We all know what's happening at the state and we're getting killed as a town and especially as a school department. So I agree with the lady who was in front of me and I say let us vote on this budget. This is ha town has the best tax structure in, in all of Cumberland County. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Dave Dittmer, 11 Woodside Drive in Scarborough. I have uh, two daughters in the school, one leaving the Wentworth School and one going into the new Wentworth School. So I have <coughs> a stake in this, as we all do. Uh, I heard someone earlier talk about this is a business. The town runs like a business and we're all shareholders. And I think that's Although I may not agree with the analogy, let's use the analogy and say, okay, if this is a business and these are shareholders, well, let's have a shareholder vote. Well, let's have a shareholder vote on the budget that's been proposed. It's been worked on. It's been analyzed. You've negotiated it. And you have stated that you want a zero increase. And that is doing your job. That's what you stated. And whether or not the people of the town agree with that statement 
is up to them, and they decide by their votes. So I appreciate your work, and I know it's a difficult decision, but before you say, let's cut a little more, and you've heard what's at stake, let's take a look and say, well, let's what, see what the people of Scarborough think, and we know who votes, so let's see what the Scar people of Scarborough think. So thank you. Thank you. Next. I'm Wallace Fengler. I live on Holmes Road in Scarborough. My wife was a teacher for over 30 years, so I, I know about education. My grandson's going to start school next year, so I, I do worry about that. But I'm also retired, and I'm 73, and I'm still working when I thought I could retire. And where that money is going, a lot of it is going to Scarborough, and it's going to other things that have gone up in price. And I'm just, I saw that the municipal side of the budget went up just very little and that the school budget went up a lot. And what I think as far as uh, what was said earlier, I still have to watch where I spend my money. And I ask that the school board and the town look to where they're spending their money and get the best and you just can't have everything. I can't afford it. Thank you. Thank you. Next. My name is Will Ledley. I live at uh, 82 Two Rod Road. I'll be real quick and just say that I want to uh, thank the council and the school board for all the work that you've put into the budget. I understand it's been worked on very hard. Um, I support that process. I support the process of allowing the uh, citizens of Scarborough to vote on it. Um, so I'm, I'm just here to urge you to please support the budget as it m is most recently proposed. I'd love it if we uh, <coughs> reinstated it back to um, the superintendent's original budget, but I understand that uh, <coughs> we have to do the give and take process and do the best we can to, uh, to come up with the best budget. So I, I applaud the, uh, the school board and the finance committee and the town council for all the work you've done and I ask you to please support this budget send it on let us vote on it that's you know that's the system that we have for citizens to vote on the budget give it to us and let us vote on it please thank you thank you next Kara O'Brien 24 Woodfield Drive and I'm reading a letter on behalf of Jeff Ertman who cannot be here tonight of course, we're at that time of year when things can become contentious regarding the school budget situation. I understand that Wednesday's town council meeting will include a public forum for those who wish to address the council on budget matters. Ironically, I'm unable to attend this meeting to express my support for maintaining the school budget numbers as presented to the council by Dr. Entwistle and the school board as this evening coincides with the high school's undergraduate award ceremony. Firstly, I get that each year the budget process presents the council with some difficult decisions to make, and I get that most residents do not want to see their tax bills rise year after year. You as council members are charged with having to make these decisions about how and where to provide funding, and please understand that your roles in this process are appreciated. My understanding is that the school budget as it stands right now is a bare bones budget that exists and contains no extras. A vast majority of the budget consists of contractual obligations. Dr. Enwistle was hired by the town of Scarborough to, for his expertise in being able to run a school department. His job is to ensure that he puts into place a system that will allow students to compete and to thrive. His track record speaks for itself in his previous stops in Belmont, Mass, and Falmouth, two outstanding school districts. I could only imagine his level of frustration when he is told how he should be doing his job in the form of the budget wrangling. Please put the shoe on the other foot for a moment and consider your own professions. Imagine how you might react to being told how to do your job by someone who does not bring your level of expertise in your field. This is in effect what happens each year when the school budget, during the school budget process. Secondly, I've been advised that the council will opt to exercise an amendment that will shut out the public from the school budget process via a referendum vote. This to me is unacceptable. Many residents who have voted against the school budget in the past because they thought it was too high 
very specifically expressed they were not voting against the schools per se, but simply exercising the right to object to an overall budget they deemed to be too high in the only way that was afforded to them under state law, a vote on the school budget. So those who are in favor of the school budget as presented by the school board want to be able to express their viewpoint as well. My concern is that there are not enough members on the council who would vote to reduce the school budget amount, even against, against the recommendation of the education professionals who prepared this budget. This potential reduction in my mind would not be reflective of the overall Scarborough community who value a very strong school system, or at the very least want to continue to maintain the values of their homes by continuing to fund a school system that can compete and prepare our students for the future. Lastly, I'm sure you're all aware that Scarborough's mill rate is among the lowest in southern Maine. There's a reason that most communities around us do not seem to have these annual battles over their school budgets. They have already taken steps to ensure that their school budget can be appropriately funded by maintaining their tax rates at levels that will provide for what is needed for students' education. Maybe I get so caught up in the process in my own town each year that I do not see the other towns having these issues. Maybe they are. But when I perpetually see my town at the bottom of the list, I have to point my finger to that as a major source of the issue. And once again, I thank each of you for your time, and I'm sorry to be unable, I, I was unable to attend Wednesday's council meeting. I believe I can reasonably assure you that the majority of parents that were unable to attend because of honors night to night have shared my same opinion. I implore your consideration to maintain the budget as it stands as well as ensuring the citizens of Scarborough get the chance to voice their opinions via a budget referendum vote. Jeff Ertman. Thank you. Thank you. Martin Tripp on the schools. I went to the workshop. Do we need $600,000 worth of computers? Does every graduate as a way of getting out of school as a requirement need to be fluent in two languages? I never heard of such a thing. We're not, if that's the case, we're preparing all college entry level people. There's no need for a plumber to have two languages unless he needs Spanish and he can learn enough. Whatever. Is the system really supplying the right mix of college prep, trade prep, special needs? I, I have my doubts. I don't think that this mix is right and is it cost sustainable? When we get up here, people say that we come to Scarborough because it's the best school system. That's a good choice. You come to Scarborough because that's what you want. And you pay for it. Who's going to pay for it? The special needs program is supposed to be one of the best. Who's going to pay for it? In this buildup, in both of these, you plant the seeds of your own destruction because the better you get, the more people want to use it. Anytime I've come to the town, they say a net input of people to the town, another family is a $1,500 loss as far as cost is concerned. Well, I, I don't know how you get out of that particular situation. But in the workshop last week, they want to bring the school level up to the level of 2010. Well, okay. The problem with that is the whole pattern has changed since 2010. And you can't necessarily bring that up to that. If you do that, you're going to add to your taxes somehow. You have to be cautious. Now, one of the ladies suggests that it's our moral and legal obligation to sustain this effort. Legal is only what the law is today. Neither here nor there. Moral? Well, you can't discuss morality on this. I can't. Let's use the word I'm interested in is credibility. Last year, when this budget was voted down and the school budget was voted down, in the negotiations, the school system gave to the taxpayer the option of one-tenth of one percent was what they were willing to compromise themselves for. In that moment, 
They lost their credibility with me. Some have some credibility left. Some have next to none. And some never had any. You can talk what you want, but if a school board member is there and is willing to say that let's offer the taxpayer a sop, a bone, and put this budget back out in that frame of mind and call that negotiated, <laughs> that's not negotiations to me. There was no thought other than to get it out there and ram it down the taxpayer's throat. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. A lot of people don't like that. That's the way I feel. And as far as the town budget is concerned, if the departments and the rest of it put in too much money and can it do any better than to return some of those funds, it isn't the town council's problem. It's the town manager's problem because he's our manager. If these guys can't come up within a framework that works, their institutional knowledge is not worth what it costs in extra expenses because there's a budget for a car doesn't mean you have to buy that car. Because there's a budget for a tree doesn't mean you have to buy that tree. Let's get it right. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, I still support the town council. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm Kelly Murphy, 5 Woodfield Drive, and I'm a member of the school board. And I'm possibly the lady that Mr. Tripp was referring to. And if so, I'm guilty as charged. We do have a legal and moral obligation to provide an adequate education for the students in Scarborough. They don't have another chance to do over fifth grade because we are in tough economic times. There's nothing extra in our budget. It's um, easy for people to latch on to a $40,000 piece of art, which is not in our budget. Um, laptops for high school students, which is not in this budget. These things keep coming up over and over again. They're not in this budget. There is nothing extra in this budget. This budget barely maintains level services. Everyone's talking about how we, household bills have increased. The school department's bills have also increased. The costs for health care for employees have increased. Um, energy costs for the school department have increased. The list goes on and on. It's not fair to say we need to have a zero increase in our budget when it's nearly impossible to make that happen, let alone the fact that the kids, year after year, it's been going on since these cuts of 2010, are going through school year after year, not having adequate funding. Southern Maine, the mill rates are climbing everywhere. Scarborough's got one of the best mill rates. The other towns are already adequately funding their schools. That's why their mill rates are higher. We have been doing the best we can with the small dollars that we have, and there seems to be no end in sight. The belt keeps getting uh, tighter and tighter, and it's the worst time of year for me. I ran for the school board saying, please don't put me on the finance committee because I don't want to have anything to do with crafting the budget that is torn to pieces by the end of it. It's heartbreaking. Um, and it seems to be happening every single year. We get to this point, and we're asked to cut more. And I voted against it last year, and I'll do it again. This budget is the budget we need to have. We need to have a bigger budget. And I understand taxes. I have grown up in Scarborough. I've known Mr. Fengler since I was about nine years old. I understand that Scar Scarborough has changed. There are people here who can't always afford um, to keep up with the tax base. I understand that. I know that. We all are taxpayers. But I also know that there's nothing that the seventh grader sitting in a classroom right now in a study hall can do about it either. They don't have classes because there are no teachers to teach the classes. They're sitting in study halls several periods a day. That is unconscionable to me. And I will vote against any reduction. And I insist, I beg and plead that you let this budget go to the people to be, vo to be voted on. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, 
I'm Dick Springer, apartment J313, 15 Piper Road. Uh, I think we do have a moral obligation to our children, and I think people should look realistically at the job market, which we know has been terrible the past few years, and I, it seems to me is projected to be not very good for quite some time into the future. And we also can look at statistics on how well students who go to college and who go to good colleges do compared with uh, other students, and the gap is winding and winding. A question is, do we want our students to be on the upward track or the downward track? And unfortunately, uh, it doesn't come free. And uh, I think, Thinking of the future of our children and the problems they are going to have in life requires that we do everything we can to give them the best education possible. And uh, uh, cutting things that, well, cutting bone is crazy. And I don't, I think that is absolutely wrong. And one other point, thinking in purely selfish terms, the quality of the schools has a lot to do with property values as the schools go downhill, property values will go downhill. So aside from the moral aspect of it, the personal financial aspect, I think, is something that you should realistically keep in mind also. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening, council members. My name is Cheryl Greenleaf, um, 31 Stanford Lane. I wanted to voice my support for the school budget this evening as proposed, and I'm asking for your consideration in allowing the residents of Scarborough to vote on the school budget as proposed by the superintendent, Dr. Entwistle, and our school board. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Jody Shea. I'm at 23 Windsor Pines Drive. Forgive my voice, I'm, I'm losing it tonight. Um, <clears throat> I stand before you as a school board member and as a parent. And as a school board member, I have to admit that, one, I'm new, but two, I'm extremely frustrated. We, the school board was elected, the members were elected to ensure quality education for the children of Scarborough, provide them with the best possible education this town can afford, and we've proposed a sensible budget that has been trimmed of any extras. This is a bare bones budget. In addition, this budget includes state and federal unfunded mandates, mm -hmm. which, need to, which we need to by law adhere to. Unfunded mandates meaning the government tells us we have to do it, but they don't want any part of paying for it. There are also programs and positions that we are required to implement because they are considered necessary to ensure the safety of our students and our staff. The piece of the pie that is going to be spent on new programs in restoration is this small. It's 2%. So we're moving ahead this much. You can't even see between my fingers. We need to send this proposed budget out to the voters and let them make the decision. They elected us as a school board to do a job. We've done that job, and it's now up to them to decide if we've done a good job. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stephanie Strauss. I'm at 36 Fowler Farm Road. I'm here also to express the opinion that I think the majority has had tonight. Uh, I feel we've elected the school board to do a job. They've done that job. I ask that you respect the job they've done and put this proposed budget without amendment to our citizens to vote yes or no on. Uh, thank you. Anyone else? Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the budget? Donna Bailey, 12 Gunstock Road, school board member. Just to clarify the positions, we had 14 positions in the original budget. We reduced that. It has moved down to five full-time, and the remainder of the five would be part-time people who are already employed in the district. So now we brought that down to five full 
and the increase of five already employed. The proposed budget would allow for our middle school students to no longer sit in study halls. Now I've heard in the past few days that someone in the community said our kids need more time in study halls because we need more of their time, family time in the evening. I want to remind you that we have the shortest school day you can imagine. As a school principal, I had to fill out the state forms every spring as to how many minutes the students in my school were in academic programs or in additional art, music, PE. I was amazed by how few the hours when you take away the time spent in the cafeteria, the time spent at recess, it really narrows down those hours considerably. And when you add to that the idea that we would have 12-year-olds, 11-year-olds, sitting in a room without teachers, it, it's just, it really amazes me that at this point in time, we haven't moved on to the, to the more significant things that are happening in education. We have huge issues that are facing our district and districts across the state and country that have to be addressed that are going to require money that we don't even begin to talk to you about because we're in the position where we have to even try to get our kids with teachers in front of them. The proposed budget would help us fulfill the need of our special ed students. That's a given. We have, to, we have to do that. It would also provide us with a little more security at the high school that the high school principal feels is needed. We still have the issue of the charter school that's coming to town. We don't know what that is going to look like in money for us. But from what I read, in articles, educational journals, it doesn't look good for moving ahead. It, the numbers are going to increase in, in terms of how much money charter schools are going to begin to cost. I would urge each of you to please let the voters in town decide what their will is, be it either way, so that they have a chance to vote on what they feel about the proposed budget. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, Amy Chamberlain again from uh, Ryefield Drive um, here in Scarborough. I actually just wanted to say that we've been talking a lot about budget, um, a lot about how everyone has worked so hard, including the board themselves, the school board, and we're all here for one reason. And the one reason that most of us are all here for are our children. And the one thing we seem to forget is that we need to give our children the best education that we can, whether that increases our taxes, may, may do. It, it's inevitable, eventually. Um, but we need to remember that the children are our future, and your future as an adult is the future of the children that we're discussing here today. So please don't forget that, and do put that out to the town vote. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> Miss Full School Budget. Seeing none, close the public hearing, close the hearing for comments. And please. Yeah, um, do I have a motion? Uh, move approval. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Uh, if I might offer, do, I just have a question about procedure. Do, do we need a motion to divide that three part? Well, perhaps I could just give a little bit of an intro just to appreciate for the council's purpose and also the, the public. Uh, the matter that's been moved is uh, the budget that was passed in first reading, reading which was uh, actually the proposed budget. No changes have been made to, to date. Although the Town Finance Committee has worked uh, diligently, I think there's been a total of five meetings, and I know the School Finance Committee had an equal number or more meetings. 
Uh, both of those groups uh, come forward this evening with recommended adjustments to the budget. So I've prepared three motions, the first of which uh, contains all of Town Finance Committee recommended adjustments to the town budget. The second motion captures the Board of Education's proposed adjustments, which they passed last Thursday. And the third motion is a matter that the Finance Committee took up just this morning and was a further reduction to the school budget. So I would suggest, in fact, it's, a, it's required for these motions to be offered and considered. To your question of dividing the question, you would note, uh, particularly on motion one, there are a number of components. Uh, I would suggest that you, you offer it um, as presented. If there's a council that has some question or objection to one, you could divide out that one item or multiple items. Uh, I offer that suggestion just for efficiency purposes. Well, um, I'll offer a motion to accept the um, Finance Committee adjustments for um, Motion 1, which will be for the municipal adjustments that we made through the Finance Committee. Second. Oh. Yeah. Second. Okay. Um, get an amendment. <coughs> Discussion on the amendment. That would be to reduce the town budget by a total of, uh, or adjusted I should say, through a series of revenue changes and expenditure, a total of $258,402. Councilor Donovan. Uh, would you like to go first? Oh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, this is the product of working through, um, again, this is for um, the municipal budget. Uh, these have Again, a series of revenues that have gone up, some, some things that um, we decided not to move forward with. Um, much like the school, we were looking at positions that we have either eliminated by attrition or um, staffing plans that um, certainly were, which was a bit disappointing to me, which was the four firemen that we desperately need. Um, but this is removing, like I said, all of the positions that we looked at, with the exception, I believe, of two. Um, it also increases revenues a little bit. It also fine-tunes a few numbers. Um, there was some discussion around um, potentially doing a little better with some of the revenues, like, for instance, excise revenues have been trending positive, and, and we thought that number could go up a little bit. Um, but again, um, just so I'll support it as a counselor. Um, I, I think that's a reasonable, reasonable reduction. So. Also, Donovan, um, I, I thought the finance committee experience was was good because uh, working with uh, Ed and Jessica uh, taught me a lot about it. Uh, I think we took to heart the goal of the town council made many months ago uh, to have a uh, level funding. Uh, 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 budget for the town. We rejected uh, and excluded a number of positions which I think all three of us felt were well presented, including the fire uh, uh, hires, but we held the line. Uh, we realized that the town had gone through a very difficult time in the last six years uh, and it was necessary to do so. And the result of that was that, for all intents and purposes, this budget will have no impact on the tax rate. It's one half of one percent. So uh, I thought that was uh, well done. Uh, we got a great deal of support from uh, the town manager and his staff, and Ruth. Uh, so uh, it, it was. Uh, I thought it was uh, well done. It was difficult, though. Uh, because we uh, wanted to include a number of things which we simply reached the conclusion at the present time we cannot afford it. And so that's the only reason they were excluded, not because they weren't meritorious. Thank you. There's some going on. Huh? 
Um, I agree with uh, Jessica and Bill. We we worked very hard for quite a number of meetings along with Tom and his staff. Um, I think we probably sat down with each department head twice, some of them twice, some of them three times, um, and looked over the line items. And we kept in front of us the goal that we had set of having a, a flat increase or a zero increase in the in the tax rate, if at all possible. Um, and I think that uh, what this motion does is brings us pretty close to what that is. So I'm pleased with that. Thank you. And one also over. Yeah, I was just going to add one more comment. Um, just for the folks at home, as far as um, the municipal side, which is um, Maybe just so everybody understands, this is everything that we do as a town with the exception of the school. So your trash, your police, your fire, all services, um, everything is encompassed into that. Um, so where we land on the municipal side of the budget is, um, as Bill stated, is 0.55% over last year. Um, so again, the nutshell is it's it's about two hundred thousand dollars. You you don't really get any more flat than than right that and right there. And, and realistically, that driving force behind what you see that's left is fixed costs that there are no wiggle room to. I mean, we experience the same utility line bills and those sorts of things that that go up. Um, we we get a bill from CMP just as much as everybody else. Um, so again, th th there really is nothing to go with this budget without laying somebody off at this point. So, um, again, I just wanted to emphasize that. Council Kettering? Um, no, I, I'm, I'm just pleased that we were able to uh, hold the line on the municipal side, and I thank the Finance Committee and the Town Manager for working really hard on that. Council Bennett? Oh, I I agree with this. I think it was a superb job, considering we do know that there are certain expenses that are not being appropriated, paid <coughs> from the state. It's just like when we all go to the grocery store, it costs us another 20% to feed the refrigerator. And now with those costs, we have nothing nothing we can do about it. So I think that's a very good job. Okay. Council Donovan. I think people would be interested to know uh, about uh, uh, the uh, state funding. Uh, uh, we were very active this year mm -hmm. in lobbying uh, our legislator, uh, legislature uh, to not reduce revenue sharing. And while we weren't the only community that did it, we sent uh, Councillor Katarina to speak. We had our legislators in. Uh, we made a very concerted effort. Uh, and we're, we were able to avoid the $40 million cuts that, ha that were proposed by the legislature originally, and they backed off that. So I was pretty proud of the Council's uh, efforts in that regard. So we did not experience uh, any an unusual year as far as uh, has been occurring in recent years of diminished uh, state funding. I think the school experienced the same. So that when it came to funding, this was not a year in which the town side or the school side was cut as has been the case in recent years and has been a large part of the difficulty which both the town and the schools have experienced uh, in budgeting. Uh, and this was not such a year. Okay, thank you. Anyone, Anyone else?
tonight. Do you have any strange effect on that? I'll just speak, I'll just speak louder. Um, move this motion. All right, well... Now the novel, apparently. First of all, um, I met, I, I hate seeing um, needs of the uh, munis municipal side uh, being cut to the bone like this. Um, I know for a fact that on the fire side that um, there's a lot of um, volunteers that we've lost um, and um, sometimes the trucks don't roll. Um, not not that often, but you know we've definitely experienced um, a huge decrease in volunteers, and I we've also um, um, seen the age. I think the average age they said was 45 for for volunteers. So um, we, I mean, is, and they've tried and tried and tried to. Um, promote uh, young people getting into uh, volunteer um, firefighting without um, without much success. Um, so and there's other areas I disagree with, but uh, I guess I'll um, support it in the manner that uh, maybe the cuts that we make here would be um, better served um, Putting those students in classes that are in study halls. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, and um, we'll um, motion. Me, okay. Um, so if everybody's done, um, all those in favor of motion one. Opposed. Make a motion to um, accept motion two, which is the Board of Education's adjustments. Um, move approval to accept the school board's recommended recommended adjustment for the proposal 2015 education budget by $909,806. Second. Discussion. Anyone? I guess I'll, I'll go. <laughs> I'll go again. Um, these, these are just so um, the other members of the council are, are aware, these are um, recommended adjustments um, that came directly from the school board. This was their final past budget um, through their due process um, that came to us as a council. Okay. Uh, Councilor Benedict. I hope the town manager would be able to put a percentage mark on what that does to our taxes. The effect of um, assuming motion one, which passed, and and motion two, assuming that passes, that would put the tax rate uh, <coughs> increase at 4.58 percent. <coughs> If I okay, may okay, yes, you may. There are yes. two sets of recommendations um, for the school budget. This is just the first series of recommendations that comes from the school board. There's also a finance committee series of recommendations, if that helps. Yeah, I, I would see no reason that the council wouldn't accept this. And I think that gets you to the point where the real <coughs> conversation um, will be had. Then, then it's etched and installed. Now, there's a further motion. Motion three proposes further cuts to the school board, to, to the school budget. And, uh, and I would suggest that that's certainly where perhaps you may have some further comment. But it, it simply makes sense to me, anyway, to accept these changes and get it to the point that many at the podium have spoken to 
if approving this motion would do essentially what many of the speakers asked, which is this is the school board's budget. Um, so arriving at that point seems to be an appropriate thing to do. Anyone else? Hmm. All those in favor? Opposed? Council opposed. And I have a final motion, motion number three that I'll offer that comes through um, the Finance Committee met this morning, um, although we were not in agreement, but we <laughs> did meet this morning. Um, so my third motion would be move approval to adjust the education budget by 911000 for a new school gross and adult learning of $41 million. $965,315. Second. Discussion. Just to ask you the same question, what does that do to our percentage? If you uh, look further in the packet before you, you'll see we've modeled the uh, tax rate computation based on all three motions being accepted. Uh, to answer your question, that would put the tax rate increase at 2.9%. And that was the motion that was put forward this morning, the Finance Committee, mm -hmm. that prevailed uh, 2 to 1, as I recall. Further discussion, anyone? Um, I'll just uh, offer a little this bit. Um, I won't be supporting this motion, um, just because I, I did feel, and even at this morning when we were discussing, that it went just that one step, I think, perhaps a little too far. Um, I, I will say I, I have a counter amendment that um, I'm going to offer, which, which puts us um, in a little bit of a different position. Um, this comes to, to bring us to that 2.9 um, overall impact. Um, the thought was that was absolute level services if you did nothing, if you just did payer scale, if you just did insurance and utility costs, if you didn't do any restorations and those sorts of things, that's where this number brings us. Um, so again, I, I just offer my thoughts. I, I thought it was slightly too much. Um, I have a counter amendment that I will offer if it fails um, that I can add some more thoughts to later. Councilor Donovan. The Finance Committee had a range of views uh, uh, as to what the tax impact <coughs> uh, the town could actually tolerate uh, or was appropriate. Uh, <coughs> the 2.9 kind of fell in the middle of the three, uh, and it was uh, developed from, a, from the point of view of what could the town uh, uh, except in light of what the school's budget uh, required. Uh, and I looked hard, as the three finance committee members did, at uh, what was level services, because their budget was going to go well beyond the 2.9%. It was going to be, I think it was 6.5% was what the school budget was going up, and proposed to go up, uh, 6.4. <clears throat> and that was going to have <clears throat> an unreasonable impact uh, on the town, and was not going to be uh, acceptable. Uh, certainly the seven members of the town council had considered that, especially since this was not an exceptional year for loss of state revenue. Uh, so there wasn't that justification that might have existed in other times. So uh, I looked hard at the uh, level funding. Uh, this was an effort to approximate, and I'm not sure whether I got it exactly right, but uh, <clears throat> uh, it seemed to me that I had to accept that if the, that I did not want to see harm done to our school system, uh, and therefore had to accept whatever was a level services funded budget. And what that meant was <clears throat> that uh, all of the contractual commitments would have to be met. No one would be fired. Uh, uh, and so I sort of assessed 
where where did this get what did what did this achieve for the schools so what I thought I ought to do is summarize what I thought it achieved uh, first and foremost it increases their budget from last year by two and a half million dollars a lot of money uh, to, to go up in a single year uh, uh, it gives them a brand new state-of-the-art school uh, Wentworth school uh, to be open it gives them I think on the order of 900 new electronic devices as well as new information technology staffing to keep those up and running new hires uh, <clears throat> new educational materials for programs that are being introduced have been introduced as a part of the improvements that are being implemented in this in the school system uh, raises for virtually every employee in the program uh, and uh, I'd be the first to say that those teachers more than earn it uh, uh, so uh, I want that certainly to be understood health insurance has been a bugaboo for uh, a, a lot of businesses and town governments up five percent uh, the CPI is up one one and a half and here whacked with a five percent increase eighty percent of that cost is paid for by the, t the school budget so another significant benefit fringe benefit uh, to, to staffing so I just saw I saw a lot being accomplished with a 2.9 percent increase and I thought that was under the circumstances of the case that was made by the school board uh, through their budgeting analysis that I could I could accept that it's higher than I had started out I was very much like Ed thinking uh, under two and I felt committed to it and I ran on that basis and think a lot of people voted for me on that basis and so this ex stretched my tolerable limits but uh, uh, I think there's a time when the case was made and I accept it so uh, that was my uh, kind of outlook from the Finance Committee thank you Councilor Blaze <coughs> I was the one that uh, voted against this um, because I feel that the taxpayers in this town after getting increases to in excess of 21 percent over the last four years need a break so we, we all kind of agreed to as a town council in the beginning of the year we want to make it as painless as possible um, we kind of talked about probably the most that we should be going up is uh, CPI and the CPI over the last 12 months is one and a half percent my my take was that we increase it by one and a half percent which basically because the the town was coming in so close to uh, a flat line budget would give the school roughly about a two percent increase that's where I'm coming from thank you Councilor Benedict on uh, well, I have a, I, I have a question that I I hope is a negative answer because it's one of the things that I can give it a whole lot of brothers and sisters if this is correct I was told by more than one person and I haven't been able to find out who or where this person is that the all of the furniture that came out of Wentworth School was given to a third world country so we now have to go out and buy all new furniture can anybody answer me if that's correct or not Jim no can't do that we have got to stay on point and this is a discussion between well, council anybody, members can anybody here ask please the no we we'll have to get an answer later see we got to just keep the discussion I would here. say the only relevance to the budget <coughs> would see itself in debt service to the extent that there are furnishings and appointments in the new school they would be reflected in the 
total project cost and, and ultimately in debt service, which is where, uh, which is what would uh, affect the budget. I, I don't know the particulars of that question, though. Sorry. Very good. Councilor Caterino. Yeah, I, I don't support uh, this motion. I think it's too much of a cut to the school budget. I'm a big supporter of public schools. Um, I think people are aware of that. Usually, <coughs> past years, it's been me who's been standing up there saying, support your schools. I will tell you, sitting in this chair, that you do get a bit of a different perspective on things, to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> and where I'm coming from is, in an ideal world, I would support the school budget. No questions asked. However, we don't live in an ideal world. Um, as has been mentioned by several people, we faced increased unfunded mandates, um, decreases in school funding formulas, and all of those pressures from the state, and it's ongoing. And I hope to see a change in that. And I'll say it again, thankfully it's an election year. Uh, that being said, um, I think that this level is uh, too low, and while I can't support the original budget um, that came out of the school committee, I do look forward to hearing um, what Councilor Holbrook's numbers will look like, because I would like to see uh, the school be able to at least restore some of their positions. So. Okay, my two cents. Um, I, um, I had a meeting, um, Jessica and I did, with um, the chair of the, um, the finance, school finance and the chair of the uh, school board. And we were brought up on some of the issues that the school's having that I was unaware of. And um, we spoke about doing things differently next year. Um, I, I do agree that with the comments that when the school um, comes up with a budget, it should go out to the voters. That's, I, I believe that. And the way we're doing it now is the way I've been doing it for seven years on this council. So it's just the way we, we've always done it. Maybe it's time to look at other, other ways of doing it. How, you know, and if the school budget keeps getting higher and higher, more and more people are fed up with the taxes. They're going to come out and vote. And like last year, they came out and voted too high. And um, you guys came back with a $54,000 um, decrease in the budget. And boy, didn't I catch some heat for that. But we did it anyhow. But um, moving forward, um, Knowing what I know, I, I can't support this. I came into this job and I said that I would uh, honor a uh, pledge of 3.5%. Last year I broke that pledge because I saw the need. If I see the need, the true need, I'll, I'll bite on it to say. So um, where I'm at right now... Um, I'd like, I would like to have been able to uh, um, save mo you know, money in the school budget, but um, I, I can't see it. So hopefully um, uh, Jess, uh, Councilor Holbrook can offer a, an amendment that we can get through tonight with and feel good about. So um, that's my two cents on it. Oh, we need to vote. Yeah, I just looking to see if anyone else had any <laughs> additional comments. Okay, with that, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay, we'll move on. Okay, so I'd like to offer um, a new motion for an amendment. Um, which would be move approval to adjust the education budget by 587000 for a new school gross and audit, uh, gross and adult learning of 
289,315. What this does is adjust the gross budget for education by $587,000 and brings our overall tax impact rate um, to the home owners and taxpayers of a 3.5% um, increase over last year. And the average impact on the average home is $155 for the year. And that was in the form of a motion. Second. Motion on the floor. <coughs> Seconded. Discussion. Councillor Holbrook. Um, so, how, why I'm offering this is um, a couple of things. The first one, which is, um, I mean, I certainly do hear um, and, and can clearly see, um, you know, the school contracts and negotiates for those contracts and, and whatnot. So, you know, right off the gate, before you do anything, the contracts that we're logged into are in the, you know, 600,000 plus just in pay scales and, and raises. Um, then we also have, you know, health insurance benefits and those sorts of things. Um, what this also would do would give some room for those restorations. No, it's not all of the restorations, the money for that, but certainly it gives some money towards that. Um, certainly there's needs. Um, I, I spoke a little bit about this this morning. Um, you, you really can't help that if you have somebody with special needs and, and you need to have those teachers in place to, you know, work for, with those children. Um, so it, it doesn't give everything, but it does give something, and it still, you know, avoids all layoffs. It maintains all current staff, adds a little staff, again, keeps pay scales where they should be, um, and, and addresses all um, health benefits. Um, I guess the last last part of that I, will, I wanted to maybe add is I, I do appreciate that there, and, and I do believe in the voter referendum, I, I do, uh, I wholeheartedly believe in the voter referendum for the school budget. Um, I, I do want to say it is a different position being a counselor as it is being a school board member because yes, your focus and your drive has to be those children. That's what you're there, that's what you're there to advocate for and, and I do appreciate that. What I also need you to appreciate is I'm here to take the rest of that picture and put it and how that fits into that picture. Um, I, I firmly and wholeheartedly believe that this is much as that, as far as an impact to our citizens, as much as we should be asking of them this year. Things are hard, things are tight, things are not better than they were a few years ago. We may not like that we're not where we want to be as a school, but you're getting a little closer to it. It's not by much, but you are getting a little closer to it. And I also firmly believe that the answer to somebody that sits here when they, and, and I appreciate you might not get those phone calls or those people that show up on your doorstep, but they show up on mine and they do call my house. And, and my answer to them can't be move. That, that, that really can't be my answer to them. It's I did the best I could. We, we gave a little. We tried to work with things a little bit. This is what we have and, and this is where I'm supporting it. So um, I hope my fellow councillors support this as well. Council Kettering? Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Council Blaze? Council Benedict? I, I, can't, I can't support it. It's too high as far as I'm concerned. I, okay. I still have to go with a max of a 1.5% one, one increase, but I mean that's not going to even get voted on, so. Also been in there? No? Well, <clears throat> I'm also glad that there's a taxpayer vote on this. Because <coughs> we all look at things differently. Um, one thing from a business point of view that when at the beginning of the year, beginning of the year we come out with a number and that number has a lot of thought, conversation, phone calls, door knocking, emails. So when that comes up, that's basically what we expect to have come in. And from a business point of view, as 
to head people up here. That's what we expected. And one thing I don't, I, honest to God, I don't like. It started last year. We came up with a, with a, a number. And the school people came in with a 15 million more. So it was a give and take, back and forth. And it shouldn't be like that. If the head people of the town say we should have this, then that should be the number that the treasurer writes over here and says we got to work to this number. I won't say how you do it is my business, but 19 years ago the people of the town wanted the school board budget be appropriated through those people. So that is where it came out of the hands of the councillors. And it, it, to, to come in and have to play this back and forth tennis ball, ping pong, it, it shouldn't be that. Um, and if someone on the school board can turn around and say, well, let me show you where things <coughs> are. Because everything can't be big. And <coughs> when I see the business, and I'll sure I'll find out, but the business like the furniture up with the Wentworth, that's not helping the students or their education in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I. I in business, if you're given a job to do, that's what the job is expected to do. If you know, if it was a little bit percent, yeah, even a percent and a half is pushing it. But that's a, that's that's what we found out from the the, the taxpayers in town. That was the message we put on, and it was the same thing again this year, starting up at I don't know nine to ten percent. Not, not going to fly with me. Thank you. Can I just add Council one Holbrook. One last comment. Um, before I forget, and I, if I'm reading my, it's getting late, guys. Um, if I'm reading my handwriting right, that is still um, the proposal that I, I've offered. Um, just food for thought is 2.8 million over last year. Um, so I, I do want to just kind of offer that for, for everybody to know. Anyone else? Councilor Donovan. The referendum aspect of this is it, it's, it, there's an oddity here that I think the school board has to grapple with and the town council has to grapple with. <coughs> School board does its job, works hard at coming up with a budget, uh, but it doesn't control its destiny. It comes over to the town council, and, and the town council has to decide on a number, but yet it doesn't control the matter. It then goes to a voter decision where many of the people really, they elected us to make the decisions and are saying, why are we now being asked on a $40 million budget to say whether this is right or that is right. So this, the system strikes me as unusual. Uh, I also think that reasonable people can disagree because when I listen to uh, Jim or Ed talk about a more conservative environment, I really accept it. But when I listen to uh, uh, Jessica or Jean Marie's comments, it makes sense because they're trying to deal with the reality of the situation. Uh, uh, while I hate uh, to exact upon the town a 3.5% increase, I will actually vote for this because the matter will then go out to this unusual referendum circumstance and the opportunity for the town to be heard and to tell us whether we're being excessive or we're being too low. 
and we'll be able to judge for ourselves. But at least I think the 3.5% was reasonable people can disagree, but yet it's a reasonable approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, and therefore, I'm willing to go along with it for the purpose of achieving a majority to move this matter along. We, yeah, we. Um, yeah, th that's that's a good point, um, Councilor Donovan. Um, we had this referendum um, that was brought to us by the state, mm. or put on to us by the state, uh, for one reason or another. You know, we, we know some of the reasons, but and uh, we but we've never we've always kept doing the things the way we do. Um, well, next year, I think we need to look at the law, look at where we stand, um, talk to the school board, and you know, and see where we go from here uh, because we've never changed the way we do stuff. I hate. Having to be at odds. I have tons of friends that have kids, and I have tons of friends that are retired on a fixed income. And it's I hate being put in this position every year. It's almost like you can't win. So um, maybe there's a better way we can do it. And um, like I said, we put it out to the voters. And they can tell us whether it's too high or too low. They know that the, the town budget is coming in at 0.55, and they know what the school budget is. So if they're really that concerned about their taxes, they need to go vote. And that's a question I ask everybody. Did you go vote? Mm -hmm. And I get, a lot of times, I get no. Mm -hmm. Whose fault's that? I can tell you right now, I'm not bragging, but since I turned 18 years old and was eligible to vote, I have never missed any election in this town, ever. And I've only voted once absentee. And I work 24-hour shifts, and I made the time to vote every time. So there's no excuse in my book for not voting on something important as your taxes. With that, I'm sorry, I get carried away. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, on motion three, amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? Two. Opposed? That's a vote. Now, on to. No further hmm? Are there any further amendments? Oh, correct. Right. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. Are there any further amendments? Did that just amend it? Right. You know, I have to vote on Are we going to vote? Councilor Holbrook, okay. any further amendments? Uh, no. <laughs> any further amendments down this end? I think everyone's closing. Seeing none, it's going to be a roll call vote on the <coughs> combination municipal school budget. Councilor oh. Holbrook? Yes. Councilor Donovan? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Blaze? No. Councilor Benedict? No. Chairman Sullivan? Yes. It passes. Uh, Chairman Sullivan, I'd like to note that it is the past 10 o'clock. If the council wishes to continue with new business, they need to suspend the rules and continue past the 10 o'clock hour. Do I have a motion? <laughs> We've got one item. Two. Let's about two items. They can be quick, I think. Yeah, I need a motion to suspend the rules. Yes, so moved. Second. All those in favor to suspend the rules and continue. Aye. In favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just uh, we'll take a couple of minutes. Take a couple of minutes and let the room clear out and have it quiet and continue. Just. First reading and schedule for the hearing. Just do the two action items. To the, um, items. Okay, and then, um, no, we're going to just cut it to two items. The two items are yeah. uh, yeah, adjourned. We've got to get together on a ship or a uh, ordinance committee. We've got to get that stuff going. I can't wait for her anymore.
Okay, we're ready to go. Order number 1445 is actually to include the appointment of Michael Bunting to the Scarborough Housing Alliance as recommended by the Appointments Committee. Move approval. Second. Second. Oops. <laughs> Discussion. Oh, the question. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Under new business, order number 1446 is the first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 313, the Property Tax Assistance Ordinance. I could just provide a yes. very quick introduction. I'm pleased that you suspended the rules as this matter, I think, has a direct bearing. Uh, this matter is a uh, proposed set of revisions to the property tax assistance ordinance uh, to be compliant with the changes in state law. The formerly known uh, circuit breaker program was, was done away with and replaced with something called the Fairness Tax, uh, Property Tax Fairness Credit Program. So many of these changes uh, align the, the language mm -hmm. um, and reflect the fact that uh, there's a new state program. Um, and I think it might be quite important to many taxpayers that we get the local authority, assume our local authority and have a locally funded and administered property tax relief program. And that's what this will do. Okay, discussion. Oh, I need a motion. Move approval. Second. Okay, discussion. Man, now to say that uh, uh, Councillor, ex Councillor Elquist, and I um, worked very hard on this a long time ago to um, bring uh, relief to um, taxpayers. Um, mostly, we were in mind were um, elderly and um, retired and on a fixed income. To uh, you know, boost what the state did. Now that the um, uh, state has really lowered it, it, this is more important than ever. Mm. So um, I, I'm thinking in the future that we'll um, be on the state's case to uh, try to uh, provide more for our citizens and, you know, tax relief. So it's very important. So. I definitely support this going forward. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Um, next, uh, we're going to go, we're going to skip uh, 8 through 11. So we can get <coughs> late. So, uh, motion to adjourn. Oh. Wait a minute. Oh, oh, just a minute. Can I do one committee? Just because. Um, an appointment. Okay. An appointment. Go ahead. Uh, we just want to post a name for uh, uh, appointments committee met this evening prior to tonight's meeting. Uh, I just want to post Charmin Kavadiski. Thank you. Um, for historical preservation. Okay. Uh, Councilor Katarina has one thing also. I just wanted to congratulate the Scarborough Academic Decathlon team for coming in number three in the United States in their division. They did an awesome job. Okay, anyone else? <laughs> nope. Councillor Blaze. I just want to uh, make an announcement that our next council meeting is going to be down at the Veterans Home oh. on the 15th. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. That's good. Yeah. And it's going to be at 7 o'clock, <laughs> and at 6.30, uh, you can go down there. You can have a, uh, a uh, tour of the facility. Um, and they're really looking forward to hosting it. They did last year and was